Welcome back, and uh, here is uh, Radex time. Hello everyone, welcome to the day three of the XDC 2020 conference. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the two previous days. The third day is, the schedule is full of exciting talks, so it won't take much. And I hope you are excited uh, for the last day of our conference. So let's start with thank you or big thank you for our sponsors. So we are, uh, well, thank you very much for organizing the conference, the XORG Foundation and the, the Intel Com Corporation. Thanks a lot. Thank you for being platinum sponsor, uh, Intel. We really appreciate the support this year. Thanks for being gold sponsor goes to Google as well. Thanks Google for sponsoring this year's XDC. Thank you, NVIDIA, for being gold sponsor for XDC 2020. Uh, would like also to uh, you know, send big thank you to Collabora for being silver sponsor this year. Big thank you to Igalia. Thank you for being silver sponsor for XDC 2020. Thank you, the Linux Foundation, for sponsoring XDC this year. Thank you, Microsoft, for also being silver sponsor this year. Thank you, AMD. Uh, we really appreciate your uh, silver sponsorships to XDC 2020. And big thank you to ARM also for sponsoring uh, XDC 2020 on silver sponsorship level. Also, big thank you to our bronze sponsors. Thank you, Kronos Group. Thank you, Dorota Chaplayevich, and thank you, GitLab, for sponsoring XDC 2020 on the bronze level. Also, would like to uh, like say, say a big thank you to our supporter, Code Weavers, this year. And thanks very much, LWN Net, for uh, donating the website hosting for us. So, just some small logistics for day three. Uh, Small reminder to all our speakers. So far, you're doing a great job uploading the presentation slides to our website. It's a small reminder this time that uh, it's last day. So let's make sure that by end of the day, we have all the presentations uh, available for uh, you know all the attendees and interested people. So please make sure you upload your presentation. In case of any issues or difficulties, please reach out to me on IRC. I'll have one more slide saying who am <laughs> who am I, or you know the, my nickname. Hopefully, you all know it by now. Uh, so, uh, live stream URLs and uh, attendees how to is still available on our website. Uh, small reminder to follow up us on Twitter for latest news about the uh, schedule changes, updates, and uh, you know, all the information about who is talking right now. Uh, in case of any questions, reach out to organizers on IRC on Freenode. So it's myself, Martin, and Arak that will be available for all of you throughout the day. Uh, Please be informed that we still have hallway uh, discussion Jitsi instance available for you. So make sure that if there are any uh, topics you would like to discuss, uh, you reach out to us and we'll help you out setting up the room or you can just feel free to go and set it up yourself. Uh, program is available on our website. Uh, just a small reminder on how to modify uh, the time zone to fit into uh, into yours. So the, the schedule is visible in correct time zone for you. Uh, this is last day. We still have slots free for lightning talks and the demos at the end of the day. So let's make uh, sure that if there is any hallway track topic discussion, uh, you reach out to us and we schedule the lightning uh, talk to summarize the discussions. Also, uh, make sure that uh, throughout the day, you reach out to the organizers to, to get your topic uh, in our schedule. Just uh, after the lightning talks, we'll be uh, summarizing the conference and 
uh, hopefully uh, you know hopefully uh, we'll see each other next year and uh, we'll have great time code of conduct so we as organizers and xorg foundation are dedicated to providing you a harassment free conference experience so we do not tolerate harassment in any form to any of our participants or speakers make sure that if there are any breaches of the code of conduct you reach out to uh, one of the following people so it's myself Lute, paul or Keith Packard, you can also message us directly on IRC. Let's make this experience very pleasant for everyone. So far, we are doing great. So hope you will uh, enjoy the last day and uh, you know send us feedback during the day and also welcome feedback at the end of the conference so we can improve for you next year. Thanks a lot. Have a great day three and uh, see you around.
Samuel, the stage is yours. Thank you. Hello, I'm Samuel Iglesias, member of the graphics team at Igalia. In this talk, I'm going to explain how to improve Chronos CTS coverage using uh, Mesa code coverage. First, a few words about myself. Um, I have been contributing to Mesa and to Piglet for six years, and I have been contributing to the Chronos conformance test suite for three years now. I'm also a board member of the XOR uh, Foundation since 2019. What is uh, Chronos CTS? It is an open source conformance test suite developed by uh, the Chronos Group. It is mandatory for the drivers to pass the respective OpenGL or Vulkan test in order to get the respective conformance. Furthermore, uh, CTS is very useful for pure uh, driver development. We can test implementations of new extensions, features, or even uh, detect regressions. Unfortunately, uh, there are cases where CTS is the only source of tests for specific extensions or features, especially for the newer ones. Because of that, the test coverage is very important. There are uh, several ways to come up with, with new tests. First, we have the traditional approach, which is uh, doing the normal test development, like, for example, developing tests for new extensions. Then there is another way, which is when the um, driver developers realize that there are missing test coverage in CTS. For example, uh, we collaborate with our colleagues at Igalia that develop the graphics drivers for the Raspberry Pi 4 uh, in order to develop the uh, CTS test that um, they found uh, uh, gaps in the coverage. Uh, there are other approaches, like for example, fast testing that, um, for example, could provide invalid, unexpected, or, or even uh, random data as inputs to the different API functions or to say their codes, um, among other things. One example of, of this work is the um, Google project called uh, Graphics Fast. In this talk, I'm going to talk um, about another way to find new missing coverage for the CTS. It is based on analyzing the MESA code coverage after running the whole CTS suite on different drivers. Let's start first with the setup. Um, for doing the MESA code coverage, uh, we use our own existing internal GitLab CI, uh, which uses uh, Docker internally. Our internal CI was used for Intel GPU driver development, so it made sense to reuse it to run the test there uh, to get the coverage data. Also, because the Intel drivers are very mature and have support for uh, lots of extensions um, and features, um, it makes totally sense to, to use that uh, those machines. Similarly, we test AMD uh, MESA drivers, including uh, both ACO and LVM backends for the uh, RADV driver, as they are very mature as well. In, in this talk, I'm going to focus on, on Vulkan drivers, and this was our, our uh, first goal, as, the, <clears throat> as it is where CTS uh, test development um, is, under, is uh, under heavy work and the test coverage is very important. Also, the procedure that I'm going to explain in these slides uh, works the same for OpenGL drivers. First step is to create a Docker image with a MESA build with code coverage support enabled. As we are using uh, GCC uh, toolchain, we use GCO for doing that. In that Docker image, we also have the uh, CTS build that we are interested on, on testing. Like for example, a specific development branch of CTS or a public release. Then, uh, once we got these Docker images, we run them on different machines in order to get info uh, from different drivers as they may support different extensions or features. We also run on different generations of the same GPU family in order to get a better idea of what has been testing or not. Uh, finally, we generate an HTML output with the coverage results uh, using LCOV. Also, sometimes we, pu we push the data to a third-party service like CodeCov if we want to share it uh, publicly. 
This is an, an image of our GitLab CI pipeline. We have four stages here. Uh, first one is the Docker image uh, generation. The second one is the execution of it on different um, uh, drivers, backends, uh, generations, etc. The third step is uh, the one that is gathering all the results. And the, forest, uh, the last step is to publish it uh, to a third party service um, and so on. This is a screenshot on how uh, Elcov looks like. As you can see, it is uh, quite simple. We can dive into any folder of the source code and see the code coverage per line of a specific files. We can also see stats of the overall coverage per folders um, and files if you browse into these uh, folders. For example, this is a screenshot of part of the spearv2nir.c file. This file is the one processing spearv instructions and translating them to near intermediate representation. On the left, it has some counters to indicate uh, how many times a line was uh, executed over the execution of CTS um, in, in this case. The same information is provided by a third party service like Code Code. You can navigate through the source code, uh, folders, and see the coverage per file and the stats of the overall code coverage uh, per folder profile, like um, I just explained with Elcov. Although CodeCov provides the same information than Elcov, it is a bit confusing. Uh, notice that on the left, uh, the number there is not the number of times um, a line was executed. It shows how many code coverage uh, runs has hit this line. In this case, it means one CTS run. Uh, if you want to know how many times a line was executed by this uh, CTS run, you need to put the mouse on top of the number and it will uh, show it to you. GCOV is a great tool, but it is not perfect. One issue we faced was uh, related to fall through switch cases. GCOV doesn't keep the counters of how many times a fall through uh, switch case is executed, or if it's not executed at all, or selected at all in the switch which is problematic to detect SPIRV of codes that are not being uh, tested. For fixing that, um, we wrote a script that adds a couple of dummy lines between the fall through switch cases uh, to see if, if, for example, the SPIRV um, of code is actually executed or not. Thanks to that, we can easily detect missing coverage here. Once we got the uh, MESA code coverage results, it is time to analyze them. We currently uh, do it by hand. In this talk, I will focus only on Vulkan drivers, but for OpenGL drivers, the process will be very similar. For Vulkan API entry points, we check those that are provided by the drivers that we are, we are analyzing. We check if the, all the arguments are used, for example, or there is a, a missing case that can be easily spot by checking uh, the coverage of the source code. Before talking, on, uh, talking about how to analyze SPIRV of codes, let's start with a diagram of the MESA Shader compiler architecture. We typically start with a, a GLSL uh, Shader that can be compiled directly by MESA, like for example, in the case of OpenGL, or we can process uh, um, an SPIRV shader. If we focus on Vulkan, uh, the SPIRV shader will be translated into near intermediate representation. And from there, it, it could be, uh, it's going to be used by the driver's backend in order to generate the assembly code that is going to be executed on the GPU, either directly or using LLVM as an intermediate step. So um, for checking the coverage of, of SPIRV codes, we look at different places. The main one is a source compiler SPIRV folder, which is where all the SPIRV of codes are processed and translated into their equivalent on NIR. However, we found that sometimes the SPIRV of codes can be um, 
um, used with different data types. And it's uh, processing here is uh, generic enough that we don't know if any of these different data types is not uh, is missing in the coverage. For that reason, we also check the driver's backend compiler, because in some cases, um, these generic uh, these generic cases are managed separately in the drivers and can uh, we can find easily if there is any missing coverage in a given speed view of code. As one driver can split it, uh, can split one some uh, speed view of codes, but not others, and the other way around for other driver, uh, we this is the reason that we are running the test on, on different drivers. Um, as I said before, currently we are only focused on RADV and Anvil because they are very major um, and very uh, feature complete. One example of, of this work is, is this one. Thanks to ACO, we found that some relational operators were not tested on 64-bit data types. Um, thanks to this uh, analysis, it was easy to add them in CTS, actually. Um, the conclusions of this work are the following ones. Uh, we use an open source uh, different open source tools as GitLab and Docker for, for this work. Uh, thanks to running this code coverage analysis, we found that uh, nowadays CTS coverage is pretty good already. Um, one thing to improve um, is that uh, we are analyzing the MESA code coverage uh, by hand right now. Uh, we have some ideas to automatize it that we uh, are planning to do it in the future. Um, also, we found that this uh, code coverage analysis is not going to replace any traditional uh, test development or, or other approaches like fuzzy testing or, or any other one. Um, the contrary, it's going to complement those. Um, good news is that we are not alone uh, doing this. Uh, Swift Shader driver is also doing it for, for some months. Uh, even some proprietary drivers are doing it uh, internally. Um, however, if more drivers do the same, um, they submit issues to uh, CTS issue tracker or they provide code with uh, the missing coverage for CTS, I mean, it is going to I mean, it could be great. At the end, all the drivers will benefit from, from it. Um, I hope we can see more on this uh, in the future, to be honest. Um, this is all. Uh, do you have any question? I don't see any questions on IRC right now, uh, on any of the channels. Yep, so I guess that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your talk.
Um, hello, my name is Ricardo Garcia. I work at Igalia as part of his graphics team, and today I will be talking about the extended dynamic state Vulkan extension. At Igalia, I was involved in creating CTS tests for this extension and also in reviewing the spec when writing those tests in a very minor capacity. Uh, this extension is pretty simple and very useful, and the talk is divided in two parts. Uh, First, I will talk about the extension itself, and then I'll reflect on a few bits about how this extension was created that I consider quite interesting. So first, uh, what does this extension do? Its documentation says that the extension adds some more dynamic state to support applications that need to reduce the number of pipeline state objects they compile and bind. Uh, in other words, as you will see, it makes Vulkan pipeline objects more flexible and easier to use from the application point of view. So, uh, to give you some context, uh, this is a typical graphics pipeline representation in many APIs like OpenGL, DirectX, or Vulkan. You've probably seen variations of this a million times. Uh, the pipeline is divided in stages. Uh, some of them are fixed function, some of them programmable with shaders. Each stage usually takes some data from the previous stage and produces data to be consumed by the next one, apart from using other uh, external resources like buffers or textures or whatever. Uh, so what's the Vulkan approach to represent this process? So Vulkan wants you to specify almost every single aspect of the previous pipeline in advance by creating a graphics pipeline object uh, that contains information about how every stage should work. And once created, most of these pipeline parameters or configuration cannot be changed. Uh, as you can see here, this includes uh, shader programs, how vertices are read and processed, depth and stencil uh, tests, you name it. Pipeline objects are heavy objects in Vulkan and they are hard to create. So why does Vulkan want you to do that? Uh, the answer has always been this keyword, optimization. Giving all the information in advance gives more chances for every current or even future implementations to optimize how the pipeline works. It's the safe choice. And despite this, you can see there's a pipeline creation parameter with information about dynamic state. These are the things that can be changed when using the pipeline without having to create a separate and almost identical pipeline object. So, uh, what the extension does should be pretty obvious now. It adds a bunch of additional elements that can be changed on the fly without creating additional pipelines. This includes things like uh, primitive topology, uh, front face vertex order, vertex stride, cal mode, and more aspects of the depth and stencil tests, etc. A lot of things. Uh, using them, if you need it, means fewer pipeline objects, uh, fewer pipeline catchy accesses, and simpler programs in general. As I said before, it makes Vulkan pipelines, pipeline objects more flexible and easier to use from the application point of view because more uh, pipeline aspects can be changed on the fly when using these pipeline objects instead of having to create separate objects for each combination of parameters you may want to modify at runtime. Uh, this may make the application logic simpler and it can also help when Vulkan is used as the backend for example to implement higher level APIs that are not so rigid regarding pipelines. Uh, I know this extension is useful for some emulators and other API translating projects. Um, together with those, it also introduces a, uh, a new set of functions to change those parameters on the fly when recording comments that will use the pipeline state object. So knowing that, the going back to the graphics pipeline, the obvious question is, well, uh, does this impact performance? Uh, aren't we reducing the number of optimization opportunities the implementation has if we use these additional dynamic states? Well, in theory, yes. In practice, it depends on the implementation. 
uh, many GPUs and Vulkan drivers out there today have some pipeline aspects that are considered dynamic in the sense that they are easily changed on the fly without a, a perceptible impact in performance, while others are truly important for optimization. Uh, for example, take shaders. Uh, in Vulkan, they are provided as SPRV programs that need to be uh, translated to GPU machine code and creating pipelines when the application starts makes it easy to compile shaders beforehand to avoid uh, stuttering and frame timing issues later, for example. And not only that, uh, as you create pipelines, you're telling the implementation which shaders are used together. Say you have a vertex shader that outputs four parameters and it's used in a pipeline with a fragment shader that only uses the first two. So when creating the pipeline, the implementation can decide to discard instructions that are only related to producing the two extra unused parameters in the vertex shader. Uh, but other things like, for example, changing the front face, well, that may be trivial without affecting performance. Now, uh, Moving on to the second part, uh, I wanted to talk about how this extension was created. Uh, it all started basically with an angry tweet by Eric Langell, sorry if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, uh, who also happens to be the author of, the, of this previous diagram. Uh, he complained in Twitter that you couldn't change the front face dynamically, which happens to be super useful for rendering reflections and he pointed out to an OpenGL NVIDIA extension that allowed you to do exactly that. And this was noticed by Pierce Daniel from NVIDIA, who created a proposal in Kronos. Uh, that proposal was discussed with other vendors, software and hardware, uh, that chimed in on aspects that could be or should be made dynamic if, if possible, sorry, uh, which resulted in the multi-vendor extension we have today. Uh, in fact, uh, RADV was one of the first Vulkan implementations to support the extension, thanks to the effort by Samuel Pitocet. And this whole process got me thinking, Kronos may sometimes be seen from the outside as uh, this closed silo composed mainly of hardware vendors. And certainly there are a lot of hardware vendors, but if you take the list of promoter members, you can see some fairly well-known software uh, vendors as well. And API usability and adoption are, is important for both groups. Uh, there are many people in Kronos trying to make Vulkan easier to use, even if we are all aware that that's somewhat in conflict with uh, providing a lower level API that should let you write performant applications. Uh, if you take a look at the long list of contributor members, uh, that's only shown partially here because it's uh, very long, you'll notice a lot of actors from different backgrounds as well. And moreover, while Kronos and its different Vulkan working groups are far from an open source project or community, I believe they're certainly more open to contributions than what many people think. Uh, for example, uh, the Vulkan spec is publishing a GitHub repo with instructions to build it because the spec is written in ASCII doc. And this repo is open for issues and pull requests. So obviously, if, uh, if we want to change major parts of Vulkan and how some aspects of the API work, you're going to, make a, you're going to meet a position, sorry. And uh, maybe you should be joining Kronos to discuss things internally with everyone involved in there. Uh, however, uh, while an angry tweet was enough for this particular extension, if you're not well known, you may want to create an, an issue instead, uh, exposing your use case and maybe with other colleagues chiming in on details or uh, supporting your proposal. Um, I know for a fact that issues created in this public repo are discussed in periodic Kronos meetings. Uh, it may take some weeks if people are busy and there's a lot of things on the table, but uh, they are going to end up being discussed, uh, which is a very good thing I was happy to see, and I want to put emphasis on that. Um, I would like Kronos to continue doing that, and I would like more people 
to take advantage of the public repos from, from Kronos. I know uh, the people involved in the Vulcan spec want to make the text as clear as possible. So maybe you think some paragraph is confusing or there's a missing link to another section that provides more context or something absurd is allowed by the spec and should be forbidden. Uh, you can try a recent pull request for any of those. So obviously not artistic will go in, but interesting in any case. Uh, for example, in the Twitter thread I showed before, uh, I, I tweeted a reply when the extension was published and among uh, a few retweets, likes and quoted replies I found this uh, very interesting tweet I'm showing you here uh, asking for the whole blend state to be made uh, dynamic and indicating it, that would be game changing for some developers and very interesting for web browsers. Uh, we all want our web browsers to leverage the power of the GPU as much as possible, right? So why not? Uh, and I thought creating an issue in, in the public repo for this case could be interesting. Um, and in fact, it turns out someone has already created an issue about it, as you can see here. And in this case, in this issue, uh, Tom Olson from R replied that the working group had been uh, discussing it and it turns out in this particular case the existing hardware doesn't make it easy to make the blend state fully dynamic without possibly uh, recompiling shaders under the hood and introducing unwanted complexity in the implementations so it was rejected for now but even if in this case the reply was uh, is negative uh, as you can you can see what I was mentioning. Uh, the issue reached the working group, uh, it was considered, discussed, and the issue creator got a reply and, and feedback. And that's what I wanted to, to show you. And that's all. Thanks for listening. Uh, any questions maybe? Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, okay. So far, we do not have any questions. Uh, Jason Ekstrom has a comment. We, the Vulcan Working Group, has had many external contributions to the spec. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, it's, I think, don't think it's very, very well known, but yeah, yeah indeed, there, there are a lot of uh, uh, people who have contributed uh, already issues and pull requests, and there have been many external contributions already. So this, this thing sh should definitely continue and, and even happen more, more often. Okay, I'm going to ask a question. Um, yeah. So, how much do you think this is going to help um, layering uh, libraries like Zinc? Um, because I assume that, I mean, one of the big issues with uh, Zinc is that you need to have a lot of uh, pipelines pre-compiled. And yeah. is this helping Zinc? Or? I don't know if, if it's being used. I, I think I... I did a search yesterday to see if, if Think was was using the extension, and I don't remember if I found uh, uh, anything specific. So maybe, maybe Think people can can answer the question. But yeah, it should definitely help in those in those cases because OpenGL doesn't is not as strict as Vulkan uh, regarding pipelines. Obviously, you can change more things on the fly, and if the underlying Vulkan implementation supports. Uh, the extended dynamic state, it should make it easier to emulate uh, OpenGL on top of Vulkan. Mm -hmm. For example, I know it's being used um, by uh, VKD3D right now to emulate a uh, Vertex 12. Uh, and there's a emulator, uh, a few emulators out there which are uh, yeah, used in the extension because, you know, APIs for consoles are, are different and, and they can use this type of extensions to, uh, to make 
code better. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, Jason also has another comment saying that there are uh, even extensions in flight from the Mesa community for some windowing system related stuff. Yeah, I was happy to see uh, yesterday, or I think it was yesterday, well, uh, here at this XDC, that the um, uh, present time extension uh, pull request is uh, being handled right now on GitHub, which is, I think it's a very good thing. And uh, it's a trend I would like to continue with because, well, I, I get sometimes, you know, the discussions inside the working group and, and inside Kronos, well, they may involve uh, IP or, or whatever. So it's better to have those uh, discussions sometimes in private. But it is a good thing that may, maybe, you know, there are a few extensions that could be uh, handled uh, publicly in GitHub instead of the internal uh, tools at uh, Kronos. So yeah, that's a, that's a good thing, and that's a trend I would like to, to see continue. Uh, extension discussed in public, definitely, yeah. Yeah, sounds very cool. Um, okay, I think we do not have any questions, other questions or comments. Okay. So that's it, thank you very much. And thank uh, you very much. Uh, uh, let me congratulate you for uh, to the organizers for organizing XDC, and uh, everyone enjoy the rest of the day, thank you. Thank you. We'll see you in uh, 13 minutes and 30 seconds for the status of freedesktop.org, GitLab Cloud Hosting.
Okay, folks, the stage is yours. All right, thanks, Rat. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm going to talk a little bit about the status of the uh, freedesktop.org uh, GitLab cloud hosting. Um, so first, uh, who I am, I'm Benjamin Tissor. Uh, you can find me on IRC uh, with the nickname Bentis. Um, and I'm here because I'm a quite recent freedesktop admin. Uh, for what it was, I also work at Red Hat. So before we go too deep into this talk, I uh, would like to um, explain why we have this talk and, and why all this work has happened in the in the previous uh, year, or oh, six months, six to eight months. So back in February 2020, uh, Daniel Vetter sent out an email on Wayland Devon and on many other mailing lists, um, stating that basically uh, GitLab has become very popular. So it's a good thing, and it's used extensively. Uh, this uh, includes CI integration, modern development process, and tooling. Yay. The bad news, um, the cost was tremendous, and it's breaking our bank account. And if you go at the end of this email, uh, he mentioned that assuming that we want cash flow reserves for one year at GitLab without CI and a Trimix DC, which luckily or unluckily we actually had, um, we would have to cut our CI services somewhere between May and June this year. Um, so this was quite a bad news. Uh, this came as a shock for everybody. Uh, but if you don't want to look at everything, uh, the TLDR of the, of the talk is that we are in a better shape, we have a plan, and we are uh, managing the, the cost. So before we go too deep into everything, um, I would like to explain a little bit about the history of uh, GitLab, why we are using it, and uh, how, we are, uh, how we are using it, and why we came to this situation. So before December 2017, the situation was not good. Uh, I encourage everybody to have a look at this blog post from uh, Daniel Stone, uh, where the, the gist of it is that uh, there were three main problems for it. The hardware that we were using was reaching end of life, so we would have to pay for new hardware at some point. Um, we were running a lot of independent service, um, independent of each other. Uh, so for instance, we were running SSH, we were running Git, we were running uh, Wiki, we were running uh, Travis, if I remember correctly. And for every single bit of operation, uh, there has to be a manual admin intervention. So that was not good. And the result were that people were actually fleeing uh, free desktop hosting, which would make the whole project moot. So people started to have a look at it and see how we can get things in a better uh, shape. And basically, um, they decided to use uh, GitLab for the all-in-one integrated solution. So admin do not like to do tiny uh, operation all the time for every user, and GitLab was solving that. Um, Regarding the hardware, uh, GitLab can run on Google Cloud Platform or any cloud provider. So that's really nice uh, because you don't need to have your own hardware. You can just uh, loan it. Uh, it integrates everything uh, that we are using. Bugzilla would be there. Uh, the code Cgit would be there. The wiki would be there too. And the CI would be there. And um, hopefully a good CI. And the most important thing was that there is no more admin bottlenecks, which means that project leaders um, in every sub-project within Free Desktop are admin on their own project. So they can add, remove people, they can deal with people, they can, everybody can add its own SSH key without having to ask an admin for it. The second good point for that was that GitLab, the corporation, uh, could help uh, Daniel Stone setting things up. So it was really appreciated. Thanks a lot for that. And the third point was that GNOME uh, went through a similar process um, few months or year ago um, and they were really happy with GitLab and everything that was there. And so that's how we got uh, an initial deployment of GitLab uh, between December 2017 and September 2018. Um, at the very beginning there was a new few volunteer projects we did with some long time and so it was spawn first at the very beginning. Um, they were happy with it. Uh, some CI runners were deployed, uh, but they were not very production ready. Uh, so we had a lot of try and error with those, but that 
was fine because they were not very big projects and they were not that in, um, in need for CI all the time. Um, the interesting part was that uh, given of the, all of the SPI uh, infrastructure, it was directly built on Daniel Stone Block account, uh, but in the end it was reimbursed by GitLab for the beginning. And given that, the costs were re reasonable and they were monitored because it was coming out directly from Daniel's bank account. If you want to have a look at uh, the cost at that period, um, we were roughly uh, between 300 and 400 a month. Uh, so that was definitely reasonable. And so, yeah, GitLab was not costing free desktop a lot of money. Then came uh, SPI. SPI managed to get build directly and coincidentally we actually uh, beefed up the instance because some of the projects were there. So we grow in the cost but that was fine. There were reasons for it and again it was fine. So new project were added, Sync Meta, Meta started to use it extensively. Um, the CI started to kick in so yes uh, more usage of GitLab. But even if we were in between uh, 2,000 uh, amounts, uh, that was the yearly estimate of the of the cost of GitLab. Initially, I think the, the cost we, we thought that the cost would be between 15 to 20k, um, with a little bit of margin. But of but also, if you look at this, uh, it was also partly reimbursed by GitLab, and thanks a lot, they gave us a nine. Uh, 9k in total so it was really appreciated and that helped us setting up things up but then uh, if you look uh, between november and uh, 2018 uh, to november 2019 um, the the costs were uh, slightly hidden uh, by the 30k grant from google so Basically, we went to Google or Google came to us uh, and they gave us a 30K grant to run on Google Cloud Platform. So that was really nice for them. But that came also with a trick. Uh, the trick was that it completely uh, hit the costs uh, between April, uh, when we started to, to have the, the, the grant, and November, when we actually started to have um, finished the money that we had in the grant. So basically, what happened is that uh, between November uh, 2018 and November 2019, we thought that we were still in the yearly estimates of what we thought GitLab would cost. When November came in, the first bill uh, was almost 4,000. That was um, a little bit more than what we had six months ago, but that was still fine. I mean, that's not good, but that's fine. But then December, January came and we were roughly at 6,000 and that was way too much. And that's uh, when uh, Daniel sent out the email. So what happened? If we did not have this uh, 30K grant from Google, uh, basically this is what we, have, we would have seen. Uh, we would have detected that the growth was exponential. We were using more and more uh, the, the, the cloud and the costs were piling up every month. And so to the blue line there is an exponential regression. And so you can see that it was completely um, out of control and nobody was actually watching it. So once we dis realized that we have to do something, we have to analyze the situation, we have to understand. And so how do we get to uh, 6,300 uh, bill a month for uh, Google Cloud? So I don't know if anybody listening to the stream had ever had a cloud um, bill but it's really complex to get through it. So this is an extract. Um, it's actually more condensed of what you got on your bill because I, I summarized everything as a table. Um, but you've got all of these uh, objects and you don't know what you're paying for basically. So let me uh, give you a little bit of hint. Uh, let me split it in three. Um, the green one is the networking cost. Um, the red one is the compute cost, the hardware choices, and the white one is the uh, Kubernetes cost. So I, I don't ask anybody to have a look at the actual numbers and whatnot, but just that um, it's quite complex to get something out of it. So if you look at the breakdown, we would have a networking cost of 3,700 for January 
2020. That's a lot. And basically, we do not know where these networking costs came from and where they were going to. Uh, the compute costs were a little bit more reasonable um, because these are the hardware choices that we made. Uh, to be able to have a reactive GitLab and a good server, we had to make hardware choices. And this was basically this 2,300 a month. The Kubernetes costs are something that you have to pay for it. It's mainly logging, cloud storage, and some various uh, things. So that's how you get to 6,000 6, amounts. The problem is the networking cost. This is something that we did not anticipate, that nobody anticipated, and it was like the big, the big surprise. So to be able to split that bill, uh, to understand it, uh, you have to split by product. There are actually two products involved in networking. One is the cloud storage for 1,600, and one is the compute engine for 2,000 a month. So if you want to have a look at it later, um, by the way, the slides are, on the, are already uploaded if you want to have a look at the numbers. Um, but the, um, the, there are a few cloud definitions with, with that. Um, download is quite easy. It's whatever, we download something from Google Cloud Platform to the client. The egress is actually download, what they call, it, what they call download in the cloud world. Ingress is the other side, the other way around. So that I counted from the client to the compute node. This is free uh, from Google, luckily. Uh, and a node is a machine in the cluster. So if we try to analyze a little bit what is the compute engine and what is the cloud storage, um, the compute engine is basically what anything that goes out of gitlab.fullestop.org, uh, being the web, the Git API, and anything else that is not in the other side. <laughs> cloud storage uh, is the um, uh, everything that comes out from Google Cloud Buckets. So these buckets are cloud storage. And these are namely the artifacts, the registry, uh, the large file system, and the uploads. So what could be done at that time to try to reduce the cost? Uh, in terms of compute engine, uh, we wanted to have a look at it. The problem was that the current installation that we had had local addresses in the logs. So it's kind of hard to know if the data that you are logging is going outside of the Google Cloud Platform if you only have local addresses in logs. So basically, we couldn't do much more at that time regarding Compute Engine. However, the cloud storage networking costs were something that should be doable to get something out of Google because it's only um, Google Cloud uh, storage, and this is a product from Google for I don't know how many years. Unfortunately, the current installation that we had at this time uh, did not have any useful information for us. We could not get any uh, valid information to know who, which project is using what, and if it was registry artifact, uh, whatnot. There, there was like we were having a discussion, knowing whether it was artifacts or registries, and we didn't know. But there must be a way. So Daniel uh, enabled the logs uh, by running this wonderful command, uh, if you ever want to have a look at the documentation. And this creates a CSV file, which I'm going to show you, just one line, um, that gives you everything. Every single access to the Google Cloud Storage gets logged. We've got the IP address. We've got the URI. We've got um, the size that we are putting. And we've got a lot more information. That's very nice. The problem is that every single access to the cloud storage is one line, and you've got eight files per hour that are all not ordered, and you have to squeeze things back together to be able to provide something interesting. And so that's why Daniel Stone opened this uh, issue on the free desktop tracker. Uh, we have a massive growth in usage, and we need to figure out who to blame for this um, so that optimization effort actually directed where we benefit the most instead of just wild guesses. First priority was Google Cloud Storage downloads because that was growing the quickest, and that's also where we could actually have logs. We'd want to be able to ascend use network between both to projects to know where to cut artifact size and to external CI runners lab in order to know where we really need better caching. So basically, where are we? 
Uh, one biggest mistake of my life, probably, something like that. Hey, if it's not too big of a task, I wouldn't mind volunteering to try to get some info out of it. Actually, it's the exact way. So as soon as you start doing something, you, you get admin. And so that's how I got on board. So, um, Regarding, uh, so, so previously we, we thought that uh, we are, we need to, to do something about the cloud storage. So that was a, a first first attempt to, to reduce the cost. And so the first thing was to do an analysis. And that was actually what I mentioned previously, provide a Python script to pass the Google logs. So the repository is there, it's on free desktop. You can, uh, you can have a look at it. Uh, it's maybe not the greatest Python code ever, but it works. What it does is that it simply passes all of the logs, try to aggregate them together, and store everything in a time series database. If you don't know what a time series database is, it's something where you can put logs and data. Um, and the time series database I'm using is InfluxDB, um, so that I had to install it on the Google Cloud Platform, of course. Um, for the record, I initially tried Graphite, uh, but it didn't work well enough for us because we wanted to have multiple dimensions for every single uh, log point. But of course, once we publish the data in a database, we need the tool to actually export it. And this tool is called Grafana. Um, Grafana is nice in a way that uh, it's also integrated with GitLab. If you install the product, um, either the Omnibus install or the um, native Kubernetes installation, um, you can have access to it. Um, so we integrated this together. And now we have access to to, to the logs from the Google Cloud Storage directly within our infrastructure. And these are the results for the period of March 2020. If you look at them, you'll see that we are doing huge numbers of traffic, huge data transfer for the artifacts and for the registry. I left out the, uh, the um, LFS and the uploads because they were like peanuts in the middle. Um, and what happened is that we were having roughly 50 50 between the artifacts and the registry. So we have to tackle both at the same time. So what can be done for the registry? Uh, first, we made a quick analysis on the, re the high registry pools, why we were pulling a lot of registry images all the time. So it was mostly because of the CI. And turns out that the CI runners that we were using were not optimized. First thing that I had was that the red on the disk was not configured. So we had small disks. That was not good. Um, the second point that took us a bit more to a bit more time to actually fix was to um, it was actually hard to do a garbage collector of the image that we are putting, given that the runners are shared for all of the GitLab infrastructure of free desktop. We are putting a lot of various random images from everywhere, from every project. And at some point, the disk space goes out and we can't do much about it. So we have to garbage collect the images. But it was kind of hard to do it nicely in a way that we don't delete an image that we will need in a few minutes or a few hours. So we took some steps to do some register mediations. Uh, the first was to actually configure the red, which is something which seems uh, evident. And we went from 440 gigs in slash, so in shared storage, to a dedicated 1.3 terabyte storage per runner for the runners on packet, the runner that we are actually, the free desktop is actually administering. So it was nice. It, it has an impact. We will see that on the next slide, um, but it's still not enough. Uh, the second step that we took was to rewrite a new registry image garbage collector, which we called, uh, so Daniel Stoll and I uh, wrote on that. Uh, we call it Docker Free Space, and um, basically it has three main points. Uh, it takes the, you may, the image usage into account. There is a script that scrub all of the CI scripts that are run, checks for every image that is pulled, and we publish it, that data every hour or something like that. And then whenever we put in, um, whenever we need to know if an image is used or not, we just grab from that data globally within our whole GitLab instance, and we know if we can uh, trash the image or not. So the idea is that often images are less likely to be deleted. Um, we also 
implemented some custom label support, uh, which is uh, so you can attach any, a label to an image, and we implemented two main, mostly uh, expires after an upstream repo. The important point is that you can you can set up a pipeline, create a brand new image of it, and say that you don't want the image to be there after one day. That's perfectly fine, and the the Docker free space will just clear the image after this one day has has um, been done. So that if if anybody could use that, that could help us knowing which image are meant to stay in for a long time or which are just like temporary ones. And last but not least, uh, we are running on Docker events, and it's not a cron job anymore. Um, the interest is that with the cron job that we had previously, uh, we had to do a lot of manual intervention. Uh, every here and now, some runners were full, and we had to actually go there and free up some space manually. While we, if, you run, if we run on Docker event, whenever you start a CI job, it checks for the D space and run the tools if it needs to. So this is the impact that we saw. Um, we, you can see that we, we activated the red uh, second or third week of uh, March. And you can immediately, immediately see that the, the, the number of, um, of uh, register pool dropped. So that was nice. We were happy for uh, just a week, uh, because the week after, we were full on disk, and we started back to our original registry pools. Um, so we put a hard effort on Docker free space, and we managed to get things sorted out quickly in two months. <laughs> um, and that was that was good. Uh, we managed to, to, to go down from more than two terabyte to uh, less than one, uh, like 900 gigabytes. Then we've got what I call the diet period, where everybody was taking care of it. Uh, it was the period where, ooh, are we gonna have, are we gonna lose the GitLab uh, instance or not? And then beginning of July, uh, people don't really care anymore. It's it's not a big deal. Um, we are monitoring things and we are checking whenever. Uh, so if suddenly on at free stop or some admin asks you, hey, why are we using some that many registry usage? It's because we are monitoring it and we are taking the right decisions depending on whether or not it's it's, it's a good thing. So that's that's fine. It has a good impact. So if you remember, we had for cloud storage, we had registry and artifact. And now it's time to look at the artifacts. Why had we so much artifact pool and traffic? Uh, the reason was because nobody cared about it before, and we were just using it. Yay, it's free. Let's use it. It was actually not free. So what happened? Um, I would like to send a big thanks to the Arch uh, Artifact Project user being Mesa and JetStreamers. Um, all of the people involved in those two projects, um, thank you a lot. Um, because we went from 3.5 terabytes a week to a steady 150 gigabyte a week. So uh, thank you. Um, that is that is great. I know that it has been a very difficult effort. And um, yeah, thank you for that. So now that we've tackled on the cloud storage issue, uh, can we do something about the compute engine? So if you remember, we are talking about networking. So it's cloud infrastructure to the rest of the world. We're not talking about how um, the compute engine works or what. Uh, however, before I go too deep into that, uh, I have to give you uh, small definitions for, for the cloud because sometimes people get lost in what I can say about that. Um, the first thing is that you'll often see on the web uh, Kubernetes written as Kates, K8S. Um, so that's just a thing to know. So in Kubernetes, Helm is a tool which is used to deploy applications, and the definition of the application is called a chart. So that's a very common tool to deploy on Kubernetes, because otherwise you have to manually write a bunch of YAML files that change over time, and it's kind of hard to distribute them, and so on and so forth. Um, we already saw the next three words, which are egress, ingress, node. So egress, if you remember, is the data going from the compute nodes to the client download. The ingress is the other way around. So data going from the client to the compute nodes is the upload. 
Um, the interesting bit is that the ingress is where you actually set up the rules of, hey, I'm going to talk to the registry or I'm going to talk to the GitLab instance or to the Git uh, SSH instance. Um, so of course, I'm talking about nodes. What is a compute node? It's a machine within the cluster running one or multiple pods. So it's either a VM or a bare metal machine. And a pod is, of course, a set of containers running in the same as related environment. So for our free desktop GitLab installation, we would have a um, pod running PostgreSQL. We have a pod running Nginx proxy for dealing with the ingress. And we have a pod running GitLab. So as of March 2020, uh, the situation for the compute was not great. Uh, we are actually running an old deprecated chart with outdated components. The reason was that um, GitLab provided this chart, this chart to us at some point. Um, and then suddenly, not suddenly, but that is, they rewrote the whole thing into the Kubernetes native chart, which is much better. The problem of this, <laughs> native chart is that it doesn't have the pages component, which is where you can actually provide website directly from the CI. And on free desktop, we are using it extensively, so we can't really move away from this chart without losing that feature. So the problem with the updating component within the chart itself was that the Nginx proxy, the one responsible for the ingress, if you follow the previous slide, was returning the local address in the logs. We are also using a soon to be deprecated API for let's encrypt SSL certificates. So if we didn't do anything, we would have to remove the HTTPS in the address of uh, free desktop. That would have not been good. And we were, and we are still running an all-in-one GitLab Omnibus install, which is basically that you need to have a big machine to run it. For the record, we are still requiring 50 gigs of memory just for running the GitLab instance. I mean, just one container with everything in it. And we that means that we cannot split the service across several nodes. Though on the plus side, I can't say that everything was dark. Uh, we still had an external PostgreSQL, so we could migrate this one without downtime or a small downtime window for anybody. Uh, we had external Redis, which is a tool used in Kubernetes for key value store, storage, Nginx, and Nexon Creeper definitions were also outside. So it was not that bad. So we have taken uh, some steps. First thing was to update Nginx. If you have local address in the logs, that was not good. So we upgraded it. It was almost seamless, uh, except for some people who are still right, written their old IP address. Uh, but now in the logs, we do have true IP addresses. So that's good, we can do something about it. So once we had the true IP addresses, we can try to do something with the tool that we have. And the tool that we have is called Prometheus. It's a tool that on Kubernetes that does some uh, metric scanning and everything. And so one, one, one solution was to rely on some fancy, fancy domain addresses and say everything that goes out, that goes out to the CI forms uh, would actually use a different domain address than all of the rest. So that's why if you have had a careful look at the GitLab logs at some point, you would see that you are using some GitLab packet new DFS freedestop.org or GitLab SNR freedestop.org. Um, this was just us trying to monitor the thing and trying to understand who was actually putting what. The problem is that we knew that Packet and Netsnare were putting a lot of Git traffic, but we didn't know which project were actually used and if we could do anything about it. So it didn't work as much as we wanted. And so step three was to write another script to pass the logs, of course. And now we know which project and operation is using data. And this is what we get. So. If you have a look at the graph, you'll see that basically everything that we are paying for regarding the compute engine is Git data, coming both from the rest of the world and the CI farms that we are administering. That's a lot, and um, that's something which is not very good. So the 
the total there on the right is for the whole period of between June when I started the script and till, till last week or something like that. Um, so it's still less than the registry, but it's still not good. So what is Git usage from the internet? Um, there is a bug uh, in the Git transport protocol v2 that has been reverted upstream. Uh, I'm not sure if it has been fixed or not. Um, but basically, if you do a Git pool with the stock Git install of Fedora 32, for example, of the Mesa tree, instead of pulling just a few kilobytes, you would pull the entire clone repository to 200 megabytes. There's a bug. Uh, the problem is that we can't detect it uh, on the uh, server side, and we can't do much more besides telling people, hey, please do not use that, because it just costs us a lot. From the CI farms, uh, now that we know which project to those what, we can actually pull the graph. And when we pull the graph, we realize that there is a big problem with the Mesa project. The Mesa project is using Git and CI extensively. That's good. The problem is that the runners and the project itself are not using cache at all. And every time the jobs were running, they were doing a full Git pool. And so you end up with a four gigs pool just for one pipeline. So the Mesa developers did some step to prevent that, um, but the biggest actually um, remediation that we made was actually to provide a Git cache. So what we did was that uh, we installed on packet a file server with a cloud um, file system API, so a three-like API, uh, which is called Minio. We changed the runner configuration to execute the script before pulling the Git tree. Uh, that was a tip that was given by GitLab, thanks to them. Uh, and then we also changed the GitLab CI YAML file uh, to use a cache version of the tree. So what it does is that every day we regenerate the cache and whenever we don't find the cache on the job itself, we just pull that uh, tarball, extract it, and then we just uh, download a few kilobytes. That was uh, very easy to, to set up for the project, and it's very um, it's useful. And also, this is something that can be done for any project. Um, so if you are worried about putting a lot of Git data or a lot of Git bandwidth, uh, we have this MinIO server that anybody within Prudestop can use, and we can explain to you how you can actually make use of it. Or, being that for, for the artifacts, we can also use that for the artifacts. It's it's really easy to, to set up. So what now? Where are we and why we are in a better shape? So if we take the numbers on where we are, uh, so I don't have the numbers for September, of course, uh, we went for uh, more than 6,000 months uh, to a regular 3,000. And the regular 3000 is mainly because there is a hard limit of 2500 a month just for the infrastructure. So that's uh, good. That's not enough to my mind. Um, but we managed to reduce the cost and at least to stop the growth of the, of the cost. So we are monitoring things and we are definitely within the expectation or at least we refine the expectations. And this is something that we can sustain. Though we are still burning money on Google Cloud for things that might not be useful, <laughs> so we need to do something more. So what can be done? The first step, and uh, yeah, the first step is to continue the modernization of our GitLab installation. Um, we had a all-in-one all omnibus installation, and we are migrating to the native Kubernetes chart. Uh, what has been done so far is that the registry has been pulled out which means that now whenever we do a config change on GitLab, the registry stays up, which means that your CI job, if it's still uh, running, or if you need to pull something from the registry, you might not have um, a downtime while doing this operation. So that's a win. Also, the, the other thing is that we now are able to put the registry in read-only mode for a certain period of time and running a garbage collection on, and delete all of the images that are not used anymore. In progress, and that's something I started two, three weeks ago, and it's still in progress because we still have a bug. 
uh, is the web service chart. This, once we manage to get the web service chart outside of the Kotlin Lab Omnibus installation, we will be able to do upgrades without downtime. That would be really nice for everybody. But there is a bug that we can't figure out what's the problem. And once the web service is out, uh, my plan is to move out Gitali, uh, so the Git server, uh, Sidekick, which is a task runner in the background, and task runner, which is the backup pod, and so on and so forth. And then, once we got this set up, we can actually move out from Google Cloud and put things in different places instead of having everything in our Google Cloud Compute Platform. So I would like to do thank uh, G -Streamer, uh, the GStreamer Foundation, the streamer folks for paying uh, half of our CI runners. Uh, so whenever you see your uh, Hetzner uh, runner, uh, that's GStreamer who is paying for you. So that's, uh, that's a big thank to them. Also, I would like to thank Packet, um, the company who sponsor a lot of our CI. The rest, all of the Packet runners are actually paid by Packet or hosted at Packet. And um, that's very, very nice of them um, to, to help us. Last but not least, uh, Packet offered to host our GitLab infrastructure. And this is something that we have in mind. Uh, it will uh, take a little bit of time. Uh, we need to move piece, piece by piece without having to, uh, um, to write in some dumb time. So, but yeah, thanks a lot for them. And hopefully, uh, we will be able to reduce the bill even more. So I've got a few takeaways. Um, the main thing is that um, as soon as we had uh, Grafana, uh, this helped everybody to know what was going on and to help us monitoring the state of the current installation and monitoring the actual cost. So Grafana was great. Uh, it's integrated with GitLab, so that's really nice. What didn't, uh, for the past six months, the default metrics tool were not um, matching our needs, which are basically we, we want to have a per project uh, match, not just uh, not just a, um, uh, a global on the instance level uh, uh, monitoring. And last but not least, I've got a few advice, advice for projects um, if you want to help us. Uh, if you want to help us, do not rely too much on artifacts, please. Um, if you have big artifacts and that you are reusing and you want to have caching, please use Minio for storing data. Ask us on Ash for the stop. Uh, it would be really easy to set up. You don't have to. It works very well with forks and whatnot. Also, please use um, CI templates. Uh, the URL is there. Um, as soon as you need a custom image, which means all the time. Because uh, when you use CI templates, basically, uh, you are also setting the various levels that help us uh, for our Docker free, state, free space uh, script. So that's uh, all I have. Now I'm open for any question, uh, if you have any. Uh, so I don't see any questions on IRC right now. There's just general sentiment that people are very thankful for you, uh, like for your work on free desktop. Thank you. I mean, I, I must I must say that also. Like, so uh, Daniel and Michel are also there on the on the stream, and they have been really helpful in all of the uh, all of the um, uh, all of the work that has been there, uh, being in Mesa project or in uh, in all of the infrastructure. So thanks to them too. Yeah, so you're aware I just switched to a tiled view so we can see all three of you on the stream. Okay, cool. So yeah, if there are not any questions, thank you again and that would be it. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye.
Hello and welcome to this talk. My name is Antonio Caggiano, I am a consultant software engineer and I started working at Collabora last year. Today I'm going to discuss my experience with Perfetto and I will introduce to you the GFX PPS project. This presentation is subdivided in four main sections. First, I will give you a brief introduction on GPU hardware counters, mostly from a Mali GPU perspective. Then, I will talk about Perfetto, a tool for profiling and tracing with good support for extendability. Along this path, I will introduce the Collabras open source project GFX PPS. Finally, I will explain how to get everything in place and start tracing your applications. GPU provide hardware counters that you can enable and sample. Please be aware that these notions can vary between different GPU architectures, but usually, when you enable hardware counters, the GPU starts incrementing them by a certain amount every cycle or every frame. Sampling from them means that you get a bunch of memory with their values and immediately after that the GPU resets the hardware counters and continues incrementing from zero again. Hardware counters can be associated with different logic units of the pipeline, like vertex shader, fragment shader, rasterization stage, or they can be associated to hardware units, like a shader core or cache memory. If we want to make an example, Mali Midgard family GPUs subdivide hardware counters in four distinct logic units. Job manager counters used for different kinds of workloads, shader core counters for the total activity of the main processing components of the GPU, tiler counters for details about the fixed function tiling unit as we are working with a tile-based architecture, and L2 cache counters which illustrate the behavior of the L2 memory system. By looking at hardware counters at different level of details, you can get an idea about the current state of the GPU and be able to find possible bottlenecks in the workload. We at Collabra have been working on Panfrost, an open source driver for ARM Mali devices and we managed to expose Mali hardware counters to user space. So, with two simple IOCUTL calls, we can enable and dump hardware counters. At this point, we started looking for a way to make use of them through some sort of profiling UI, and among all the options at our disposal, we thought that Perfetto seemed to be the right solution for us. Perfetto is an open source project for, from Google, licensed under Apache 2, designed for system profiling, tracing and trace analysis. It can capture kernel events through ftrace, it can pull CPU and memory counters through procfs and sysfs, and also other stuff on Android and Chrome. Extensive documentation is available on the website perfetto.dev where you can find more information about its core concepts, various design documents, and how to contribute. From a software design point of view, it follows a service-based model, where a main service is in the middle, on the left, producers contribute data to the trace, and on the right, consumers control the tracing service, performing actions like enabling, disabling tracing, specifying what to trace, or tweaking the tracing session. Perfetto provides a tracing SDK which makes it really easy to contribute new data to the trace by implementing your own producer. All you need to do is to generate amalgamated C++ sources with a script provided by Perfetto and include those sources in your project. To make a custom data source, you need to extend a C++ class named data source, 
then provide implementation from, for some of its methods and the tracing callback. So, on setup, it's called at the beginning, it gets as input a relevant portion of the perfetto config file, therefore it's used for, uh, to configure the data source. On start, it's called when the tracing session should start, so here we can set up the GPU driver, enable counters and so on. On stop, it's called at the end, so we can disable counters, tear down the GPU, generally releasing resources that we acquired before. And the callback, the most important part, it's a function registered through the data source trace method, it's called only when tracing is enabled, and within this callback we should create a trace packet and use it for recording events like GPU counter events. GFX PPS is the name of the project started by Colabra, which aims to be a collection of graphics-related Perfetto producers. At the time of this talk, it is counting two producers. A Panfrost producer, contributing Midgard hardware counters collected through Panfrost, and a Weston Debug Timeline producer, sending track events which are depicted by the visualizer as time-bounded slices. It also provides GPU perf count. This is a helper tool useful to the Panfrost producer and for testing purposes. It is able to dump performance counters data to standard output, and it can list the names of the counters exposed by the GPU. If you want to build everything by yourself, you will need to download both Perfetto and GFX PPS sources and follow the readme provided by these projects. But a nicer and faster way to get the binaries is to download them from Free Desktop GitLab, where you can find the GFX PPS producers in the latest master pipeline artifacts. In addition to that, we maintain a branch under the name Perfetto, which only purpose is to build and store Perfetto binaries. Once you have everything, in order to capture a trace, you need to run a bunch of services concurrently. TraceD is the main tracing service. It is responsible for maintaining producers and data sources. It owns the trace buffers and is able to handle multiple tracing sessions at the same time. TraceD Probes is a service with various system probes and provides interoperability with F-Trace. Producer GPU is the name of the producer developed by Collabra. This is going to send GPU hardware counters data to the tracing service. Perfetto is the command line client which starts and configures a tracing session. Here, we instruct the program to take a config file as input with dash c and parse it as a protobuf text file with dash dash txt. Then, dash o is used to specify the desired path for the output trace file. Let's have a look at what is inside a Perfetto config file? With the config file, we can specify what, how, and how long to trace. At the very top, you can see a buffer section which specifies how much memory to use for a trace and its filling policy. In this case, Ring Buffer tells Perfetto to overwrite all data when there is no more space available. The data sources section is used to enable the data sources we want. Here we tell Perfetto to enable GPU metrics, and then we specify we want to sample hardware counters every second. Finally, at the bottom we specify the duration in milliseconds of the tracing session. The output of a tracing session is a protobuf file which can be opened by the Perfetto Trace Visualizer. This 
is a web-based application available online at ui.perfetto.dev. It's really well performing, it can load hours long traces, it doesn't require any server-side interaction, meaning that your data remains within the browser on your machine. It's still under active development, so expect frequent changes in the future as new features get merged in. And here's the result. At the top you can see the timeline. You can zoom and move with WASD. Just below, there's a long list of hardware counters with their descriptions on the left, followed by their data represented as bar charts. How to interpret the data depends on the architecture of the GPU, so I would recommend you to know your hardware in order to be able to see if there is any problem with the numbers. Only then you will be able to tell where the bottleneck is and effectively find the right component of the application where to focus your optimization efforts. Thank you for listening to this talk. My name is Antonio Caggiano. If you have any question, you can send an email at antonio.caggiano at collabora.com. Goodbye, and I look forward to meeting you at Next XTC. Very nice video. <laughs> okay, Antonio. So, we have a question from Timur. Um, Oh, so he's asking, what benefits does Perfetto give over RenderDoc or API and API Trace? Why did you choose Perfetto uh, over these tools? Okay, so we actually tried various um, solutions before choosing Perfetto, and we opted for Perfetto because it was uh, actually it it was able to give us. Um, many other things from a system like uh, CPU, memory information, process information, and it was also very well documented in terms of extendability. So it was um, quite easy uh, developing for Perfetto. Okay, nice answer. Um, we do not have another question, but uh, maybe someone will make one a bit but um, maybe just one comment from me is that uh, I really like performance counters and as you said this is the only way to really get an understanding of what is going on and during the execution and it takes away the guesswork and the experiments so very good tool and um, I'm looking forward to working with Cool. I'm glad it will be helpful for people. <laughs> okay, we've got a question from Daniel Stone. Um, one other thing I really like about Perfetto is that it's very good for long running things. And if you have something totally reproducible, running through GPU viz or whatever makes total sense and constraining that. Then Bass is also asking, how useful is it for intra-frame information? Well, that is something that uh, we should work on, right? Um, everything should be added. If we want to expose hardware counters from another GPU architecture, we need to actually um, implement that as an extension, as a data source, if we want to use a Perfetto key uh, term, or if we want to give information about the frame, what's going on in terms of queues uh, or uh, you know, memory buffers, it's something that uh, it needs to be exposed. It can also be exposed through F-Trace, since Perfetto has a good interoperability with F-Trace. Uh, it always needs some uh, bit of work uh, to add everything, but the tool is really good. So um, most 
the mo most things that you uh, already need for such a tool are already there. It's just a matter of learning how to uh, add new things to the visualizer and to the, the trace. Okay. Um, well, to finish the, the comment from Daniel Stone, um, basically to summarize it, it's that Perfetto is very, very good for uh, long running jobs. And then if you have an issue like after an hour of gaming, then we get this uh, performance cliff. Um, it works much better than render doc, which uh, or API trace, which would generate gigantic files and you would have to replay everything or, or maybe not in this case, but well, I guess, yeah, you would need to replay it and then you would get the performance counters. So I guess it just scales better with uh, um, okay, bigger workloads. Okay, uh, it seems like it was the last question. So thank you very much, Leandro. Uh, sorry, you. not Leandro, <laughs> Antonio. And the next talk from Leandro is about DRM-backed tests in Weston's GitLab CI. And it will start in 13 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you.
thank you all for joining this talk. It's a pleasure to be here. And now we are going to see what has been done in Weston in order to add automated DRM backend tests in its test suite. First of all, I am Leandro Ribeiro. I've concluded my BSc in computer science last year. And in March of this year, I joined to collaborate to work in an internship project in Weston. Before explaining the problem and what has been done to fix it, we're first going to give some background about the subject. In Weston, we have multiple backends that it can use. For instance, the X11 backend, it can use it in order to run as a X client but it can also use the DRM backend. Weston's DRM backend can be used to make Weston run as a KMS user, so it will control the display pipeline and it will be able to use the KMS API to perform page flips and display its content in the screen. In order to make this happen, Weston needs to manage the DRM objects that can also be retrieved using the KMS API. And this is what we are interested in this talk. Here we have a display pipeline of a graphics card with only a primary plane available. And one thing to notice here is that as we don't have, we have only the primary plane, Weston needs to compose the image using its renders. It can be GL render or Pixman, but the point is that Weston needs to handle this. And then it will be fitted to a primary plane, and the CRTC will perform a scan out in order to put the content on the screen. Notice that if you wanted to take a screenshot using this scheme, it will be pretty easy as the compose the image is already in the memory and so we only need to save the file. Here we have another graphics card. This one has support for overlay planes and cursor planes and not only the primary plane. And the way that Weston handle the DRM objects is a little different here. First of all, Weston do not, do not have to, to compose the scene using its renders. It will simply give the image to the appropriate planes and the responsible for making the composition is the CRTC. CRTC composition is much faster and this is the advantage that we have, but not every hardware has support for it. And in Weston, we need to see what's below us. For instance, a graphics card with only support for a primary plane or multiple planes. And we need to make it work independent of the hardware. But of course, using what it has to offer for us. And one important point here, is that in this case, as we are not rendering using the GL render or Pixman render, we cannot take a screenshot that easily because the image, the composed image, does not live in memory in this scheme. It only exists after the CRTC composition, but it's directly sent to the screen. So, in order to Weston. If Weston wants to take a screenshot, it will disable plane composition, it will stop relying on the cursor and overlay planes, even if the hardware has support for it, and it will fall back to use its renders to compose an image and then feed this to the primary plane of the GPU. This happens until the screenshot is taken and then Weston will start to use the planes again in case the hardware has support for this. Now let's state the problem that we had. 
In Western, we have a test suite that runs automatically in GitLab CI and we want to use it as much as possible in order to help to avoid regressions. And other point here is that the machines in GitLab CI probably does not have a display in our graphics card connected. So how can we run DRM backend tests using this setup? This is one of the problems. And the other, as we've seen, is that we want to test planes composition because as we've seen, Weston have multiple ways of handling the planes. It may use only the primary plane or use the cursor in overlay planes. And we want to know if Weston is doing its job well. And the problem is that we've seen a few slides before that to take a screenshot, Westo will disable planes composition. And screenshots are very handy for testing purposes as we can compare the output with an expected result. So how can we take a screenshot and taking into account plane composition in Westo? This is the other problem that we had. The proposed solution for the fact that we don't have a graphics card available in the GitLab CI, for the rendering part, we don't have to worry. So, for instance, if Weston wants to perform an animation and use GL calls, Mesa will handle this and fall back to software rendering options. For instance, LLVM pipe which will then convert GL calls into something the CPU can handle. And for the KMS API, which is the part that we are most interested in and is the part that we've worked in this job, in this project, is that we can use VKMS. VKMS stands for Virtual KMS. It's a DRM driver and in implements only the KMS API and we can run Weston on top of it and it will behave like a, a graphics card connected to a display and so it was made especially to be used by test suites and we had to do some changes in Weston CI in order to run on top of the KMS here we have the scheme with the final results. So we have the GitLab runner machine that will start our Docker image. In the Docker image, we have a Linux kernel image with VKMS enabled. And so we can use KMU to start a virtual machine on top of this image. And so we can run our Weston's tests using VKMS. Here is the test suite of West running on top of the KMS. On the right side, we have a, an animation test. So as I said before, Weston will use its GL calls that will be handled by Mesa and Mesa will fall, fall back to software rendering and convert to something that the CPU can handle. And the part that we are most interested in is in the left side of this scheme that is the KMS API. So Weston performs an atomic commit to perform a page flip and this will be made using libdrm and so it will be handled by VKMS. And we also had that other problem about the screenshots in the case that we have planes composition and the solution for that is the usage of write back connectors. Write back connectors are a special type of connector. Not every hardware has support for it and it can be used to get the output from a CRTC after the plane composition and send it to the memory. So it's very handy for taking screenshots. And in VKMS, 
it's a virtual driver so it does not have this hardware limitation and the maintainers already are proposing uh, a patch to add right back connector support it's already in good shape and probably will be merged soon in Weston we also had to add support and it's a, in a similar situation it's already in good shape but there's still a few comments to address here we have a, a scheme showing the right back screen shooter that we wrote for Weston so it all starts in the screen shooter client that uses the Wayland protocol to talk with Weston Weston will prepare an atomic commit with the setup for the right back job and this will be handled by the DRM subsystem and so it will perform this atomic commit and schedule a right back job for us and it's important to notice that the right back job is not synchronous to the atomic commit completion and so Weston will receive the page flip event that means that the atomic commit completed and now Weston needs to wait for the right back job completion when this happens Weston can get the buffer that the client shared and overwrite its content with the content of the right back and so it will use Wayland again to tell the client that the screenshot is done and the client will simply save the screenshot in a file here we, ha we have a picture with the right back screenshot by the time that I took this VKMS was not considering the alpha value of the cursor plane in order to blend the planes and it was really cool for me because I could see that the plane composition was being taken into account in this screenshot so it was really cool to see this square and people in VKMS are doing a great job there are a few patches already to to fix this problem and consider of a blending. That was all that I wanted to share. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. It was a pleasure. And I also hope that other compositors can use these ideas in order to enhance their test suite and add support for automated DRM backend tests. Also, it's important to mention that how important right back connectors are and that if your hardware have support for this it's much easier to test plane composition and know if it's working good in the future weston may be an alternative to take right back connectors screen shooters and check if the plane composition is working well and here we have the patches that we've mentioned in this talk in VKMS, the patches that add right back connector support are already in good shape, and but still didn't land it. But in Weston, we already have support to run the test suite on top of VKMS on GitLab CI, and the patches to add right back connector support and right back connector screen shooter still didn't land though they are already in good shape and that was all i hope you had fun here's the summary of this presentation if you have any questions we'll be here to answer okay Hello. Is my microphone okay? Okay. Yeah, any questions? 
So let's see, we seems like we have a couple of questions uh, here. So which GPUs do support write back connectors in hardware? Uh, is this literally the equivalent of building frame grabber that really gives you what goes out of the video outputs? Yeah, I'm not sure which GPUs exactly has support for write back connectors, but I know that Raspberry Pi 3 has support for write back connectors. Its GPU has support but I'm not sure with hardware and support. And yes, I think that this is exactly the, the idea. So the chat answers, it looks like uh, Raspberry Pi seems to be supporting them and Renaissance as well. Uh, do I have any other questions here? Uh, besides testing compositions, are there plans for testing further areas of KMS API? For example, hot plug events, error cases and such. Yes, the, the, the idea was to, at first we had to do a lot of job in Western just to, to be able to have support for it back connectors in first place. But we want to grow the test coverage as, as with the growing of functionalities in BKMS. That was the first idea. But yes, we want to have hot plug connectors and this kind of tests as well. Uh, yeah, I can see that AMD or Intel don't support them. Yes, I, I, I try to use it on my own graphics card and I was not able. Yeah, they, t they seem to rather have uh, some kind of CRC capture and not like a full ride back. Uh, mm. So if gamma sluts or dithering is m messing things up for me, I wouldn't see that without external grabber. So I guess that's a yes as well. Uh, yeah, I, I think that the discussion is just going its own course right now and there are no other questions, but people were really appreciative of your selection of background and like the environment you were presenting in because, you know, the outdoors vibes. And like it's really cool project to see. I'm really happy to see that uh, VKMS is used uh, in such a creative way and like allows to test you the DRM backend. So uh, I'm looking forward to other uses as well. So thank you for your presentation nice. and see you around. Thank you, everyone. See ya.
Maciej, the stage is yours. Hello, I'm Maciej Pianowski from FreeMDEP. The topic of my presentation is software and hardware images decoding on the Raspberry Pi. Let's start with the agenda. Firstly, I will introduce myself and the FreeMDEP company. Then I will present some information about the Raspberry Pi Zero hardware. Then we will go briefly through the JPEG encoding decoding process. Uh, then I will talk a little bit about OpenMax and MMA A APIs. And finally, I will present some of the performance results uh, we performed on the Raspberry Pi Zero. My name is Maciej Pianowski. I am a female team leader at FreeMDEP. I'm with FreeMDEP uh, for over four years already. I'm interested in embedded Linux, build systems, mostly Octo, and system security. If you would like to contact me, you can use my email or you can find me in the social media listed in the slide. I'd like to share a few words about uh, our company first. FreeMDEP is embedded systems consulting company. Uh, we are based in Gdańsk, so the city where the conference is taking place this year. Uh, one of our main goals is to promote and improve the open source solutions on the firmware and the system level. Our team is mostly specialized with the UFI, Corboot, Linux, Yocto, and so on. Many of our solutions are from the platform security area. A few words about our prior experience with the Linux graphics stack. Apart from the video core GPU present in the Raspberry Pi, Pies, uh, we've been wor mostly working with the Vivanta and Mali GPUs. So with the SOCs like IMX6, IMX, uh, IMX8, uh, also with Mali GPUs, so uh, our winner, Amlogic, Xilinx, and so on. Our work was mostly on the integration on and validation level, uh, but not only, uh, we are also fixing some bugs uh, or developing some QT or WebKit applications. Uh, the board we are interested in this presentation is the Raspberry Pi Zero. And the Raspberry Pi Zero is the smallest board from the Raspberry Pi family. Depending on whether you need the Wi-Fi or not, you can get the board uh, from five to, you can buy the board uh, from five to ten dollars. The board is supposed to be in production uh, until at least uh, 2026. Uh, and considering uh, the production status, small form factor, competitive pricing, uh, combined with uh, not so small capabilities, we can assume that uh, we will see this board being used uh, for a few years. Uh, the Broadcom SOC uh, BCM 2835 is present on the Raspberry Pi Zero, but also it was present on the first Raspberry Pi One. It, con it contains one ARM11 core, which is clocked at one gigahertz. The ARM11 is ARM v6 architecture, so there, no, there is no neon instruction set. It also contains a two-core video core 4 multimedia coprocessor, uh, which provides uh, hardware support for H264 video decoding, uh, baseline JPEG decoding, uh, and a few other features. Now, now I'd like to quickly go through the JPEG encryption process from the high-level high perspective. The first step uh, in the process is to convert uh, convert the color space uh, to the YCBCR. So uh, we uh, we basically divide the brightness channel from the color channels. The next step would be the chroma subsampling. Uh, as human eye is more sensitive uh, to brightness rather than to colors, you can simply reduce the numbers of bits which are used to encode uh, colors uh, in order to save uh, the, the, the number of bits we need to encode uh, a given image. Uh, the next operation is uh, uh, moving uh, from the spatial uh, image representation to the frequency representation, and it is done using the DCT transformation. As human eyes, uh, <clears throat> sorry, 
in the, quant uh, the next step is the quantization step. Uh, during this step, uh, most of the uh, uh, most of the image compression happens, uh, as the human eye is not uh, that sensitive for high frequency brightness changes. We can eliminate some of the highest frequencies. Also, we can reduce the DCT coefficients and run them to the integer numbers. All of that combined uh, can, uh, can make that uh, we need even less bits to encode uh, the image representation. And also, a few words about uh, progressive versus baseline JPEG images. Uh, the difference uh, from the decoding perspective is that in case of the baseline JPEG, we require only uh, one scan to decode the image, uh, and the pixels are already decoded in the target quality. So if you would encode uh, a baseline image, you would, you would pixel by pixel, you would uh, see that the image uh, feels from the top to bottom. Uh, and in case of the progressive image, we, we need uh, multiple scans. And with each scan, uh, the quality of the image improves. So we would see multiple uh, from top to bottom scans. And with each scan, uh, the quality of the image would, would be improved. Uh, the libjpeg toolbar library provides acceleration of JPEG images decoding. It uses the SIMD instruction set to speed up vector operations. Uh, those are present in multiple architectures, such as x86, ARM, or PowerPC. What is important in the scope of this presentation, that only the ARM v7 and ARM v8 architectures have the neon instruction set. So the Raspberry Pi Zero cannot benefit uh, much from the libjpeg turbo library. Uh, most of the Raspberry Pi users probably know uh, OMX Player, uh, which uses the OpenMax API to enable hardware acceleration of video decoding. In case uh, of the image viewers, there seems to be no equivalent, which would provide uh, such, hub, such, uh, such support. Uh, there is uh, OMX IV application, which, is, which uses the OpenMax uh, API to enable hardware decoding of baseline JPEG images. Uh, but the, OM, the OMX, OMX IV application is not that widely used. Uh, moreover, it is also not actively maintained, uh, nor its package in Raspberry repositories, uh, which, makes it, it, which uh, makes it more difficult to use uh, by regular users. Uh, we have experimented with uh, the, uh, the code base a little bit to create a library for easier access. Uh, and uh, we tried uh, the zoom crop feature. Uh, and the results can be found on uh, our fork. As already mentioned before, the OMX player uses or, or, or OMX IV uses OpenMax API to enable hardware acceleration features. The standard itself, itself consists of a few layers. The OpenMax application layer should be preferred for the application development. But in case of the Broadcom, only the OpenMax integration layer was provided. Uh, so the OpenMax integration layer needed to be used uh, in projects like uh, OMX player. And moreover, uh, the OpenMax standard is practically deprecated for a few years. For a few years, uh, so it is not suggested to use, uh, especially in case of uh, the new applications. And the OpenMax integration layer provides a set of, of components objects which are used uh, to interact with the hardware. Each component can have multiple input and output ports. In this case, I have shown only the video and image domain but there are a few more. Uh, and the documentation of those components can be found in the Raspberry Pi uh, firmware repository. Uh, for image decoding purposes, uh, you would be interested in the three components presented on the slide. The first one uh, is the image decode, uh, which takes uh, encoded image 
in, at the input part, and it outputs uh, decoded pixels on the output part. Uh, the second one is the resize component. In case of this application, it is used to uh, basically resize uh, the image to the full screen. It can also be used to crop the input image prior displaying it. And the third one is the video renderer. The name can be a little bit misleading uh, as this component is not uh, is used not only to video but also to displaying uh, static images. Uh, apart from the OpenMax uh, API, uh, we have uh, the multimedia abstraction layer. Uh, it is a C library designed by Broadcom. It is uh, specific to the Broadcom SOCs. Uh, and the goal of that library was to replace the OpenMax uh, integration layer library. Uh, from a high level, uh, the design looks a little bit similar uh, as there are some components uh, with input and output parts, but uh, it is supposed to be easier to use uh, MMAL than OpenMax uh, integration layer. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, yes, the MMAL is suggested to use instead of uh, the OpenMax uh, uh, by the Raspberry Pi engineers. Even the OMX player became deprecated some time ago. Uh, and in case of the project, the efforts were moved to the VLC, uh, where MMAL-based codec path patch is being developed, which also proves that uh, the MMAL is favored uh, rather than the OpenMax. On the other side, I have found uh, no proper image viewer, which would use the MMAL API uh, for hardware accelerated images decoding. Uh, also, th there are no, not that much examples. <coughs> uh, there, is, uh, there is some JPEG uh, decoding example in one of the user land forks, which is linked here. Now let's move uh, to the results. Mm. In our case, the time to display was important. So we measured not only uh, the time to decode, but also uh, it was uh, the time to decoding itself uh, would be shorter than what we measured. But as, as we measured the time from uh, issuing the command to, to, to the image uh, being presented on the screen. And we have tested three scenarios. The first one, uh, hardware accelerated decoding of the baseline JPEG image. And the second one, software decoding of the baseline JPEG image. And the third one, software decoding of the, <clears throat> of the progressive JPEG image. We have results uh, for three different resolutions here. Uh, for each resolution, we have baseline hard, baseline soft, and uh, progressive soft results. Uh, all of the tests were performed on both Raspberry Pi Zero and Raspberry Pi 3. Additionally, in, in the software decoding cases, uh, we have added Raspberry Pi 3 with LibJPEG Turbo case. And that's the green one, which is present uh, only in the uh, software decoding cases. Uh, and what are the conclusions? Uh, performance of the hardware decoding of baseline JPEG is almost uh, the same for both Raspberry Pi Zero and Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, it's not that surprising uh, since uh, the same hardware accelerating block is used uh, for both of those platforms. Uh, the gain from hardware, from using hardware acceleration is more visible for images with higher resolution. And the difference is less on the Raspberry Pi 3 but the hardware accelerator still outperforms uh, the CPU in JPEG and the decoding, even if the LibJPEG Turbo was used. Uh, for example, it takes uh, less than 0 0.3 seconds to display uh, the full HD JPEG image on the Raspberry Pi 3 using hardware decoding, uh, but it takes a little bit longer, uh, 0 0.4 seconds, when using the LibJPEG Turbo. Uh, so based, it's the summary on, which we have just covered on the previous slide. Uh, and the summary of the talk, uh, 
libj pack turbo uh, is already widely shipped in distributions and we sometimes assume that it's enough to use software decoding uh, rather than using uh, than offloading it to hardware uh, but we we need to remember that in some cases uh, the libjpeg turbo is not is not uh, an option uh, there is still some hardware uh, which cannot use the acceleration from libjpeg turbo uh, in such cases usage of the hardware acceleration block is uh, especially beneficial uh, but even in the case of raspberry pi 3 uh, we can see that uh, the hardware block is slightly faster than the than using uh, of the libjpeg turbo uh, but we have to remember that the hardware block uh, has, has have its limitations. Uh, the first thing is that, uh, that it may limit the supported JPEG formats, uh, like in case of the, uh, the Broadcom SOC, only the video core 4, uh, only the baseline JPEG uh, decoding is supported. Uh, and also, we sometimes have to deal with the and not that pleasant APIs like OpenMax uh, API to talk to the hardware decoding blocks. Uh, and maybe it's worth to look at the MMA uh, API in case of the Raspberry Pi instead of the OpenMax. Uh, but maybe it could use some more examples or uh, or some video player which which are, uh, or some sorry. Uh, image image uh, image viewer which actually uses the this api to display uh, jpeg images uh, sadly the conference is not uh, happening live in gdansk this year uh, but i have a few images of Gdańsk for you and hopefully one day the conference will take place uh, live in our city Feel free to contact us if you believe we can help you in any way. We are always open to cooperate, discuss. Uh, you can use one of those contacts listed here on the slide. Uh, some references uh, which I've used uh, and that's all, thank you. So far, we do not have any questions, but we can wait a little bit. Mm -hmm. No questions or no comments, but thank you very much for uh, your talk. And you. uh, the next presentation is going to be by Jean and it's going to be about ATRI Conf. So, see you in 12 minutes. Thanks.
Hello everybody, my name is John Hertel and I'm going to introduce you to AdriConf. So first of all, who's this guy, this beautiful face you're seeing? I'm basically the person being devoted by a shark. As you can imagine, I like to be fun or pretend to. Um, I'm a Brazilian, just in case you're wondering. I mostly work on PHP and closed source stuff, so you won't see my name much everywhere. And I basically love Linux. So, first of all, why do this software? Why do this change? So, basic motivation is I want to contribute something to Mesa, so to also give something to it. Um, DRIConf was an open source project, and it was there like waiting for some GSOC, some Google Summer of Code student to pick it up. And I guess it was there for, I don't know, five, ten years. It's a long time already waiting for somebody to pick it up. Nobody was ever going there to do it. Um, yeah, and DRIConf didn't catch up with recent change, so it doesn't support Prime, it does support a lot of things. It's like super outdated. And basically, I don't know Python. And just in case DRIConf, it's a bunch of Python scripts on top of XDRI info. And since I don't have Python knowledge, I decided to go C++ and rewrite everything from scratch. That was the basic idea and motivation behind it. By the way, I didn't make it as a GSOC project because I was not eligible. I already have a degree, so I just decided, okay, let's just do this and yeah, see how it goes. Cool, let's take a look on how the Mesa configuration works. So everything in Mesa is XML based. So as you can imagine, both the configurations we write down as the ones we, we get from Mesa. Um, so how does this look for the user when they're configuring something? So they write basically an XML file with this root element, dri.conf. And then there is the, one of the most important ones, which is the device, which is the screen and basically the driver, which is the Mesa side driver name, because for example, Radion, it has also the AMD GPU, which is like on the kernel side, so you can have like different drivers. In this case, it's always the driver name from the Mesa side of things. Um, then you can define any number of applications. In this example here is Tux Racer. In case you don't know, it's a game for basically kart racing. And inside an application, you can define options. And those options can be like anything supported by the driver. You could also write things not supported, but yeah, it will be ignored anyway, so no much reason for that. Cool, let's take a look how Mesa does it. So when, when query Mesa, they provide an API that you can query to get what options a specific driver supports. And basically Mesa returns a response also in XML that looks like this. So, has a root element, DRI info, uh, has a bunch of sections, here I'm showing just one, but it has usually four sections. Uh, inside each of them, there's a description, which says, well, a description, basically saying what is this section about, and it has translations, so all this text is available in Mesa as spot files, so you can go there, you can change or add translations in, if you want. And I don't know how many languages are supported, but I guess there's only five or six languages supported. So in case you're missing them, all that just translated. Uh, and then there's also the options, and this is the most important thing, which basically defines what this driver really supports. And basically all of them have a name, which is what Mesa will query later, a type, which I'm going to talk in a minute, and then have default and valid values. And in this case, inside, we also have a description of this option. So we, in this case, in English, means a buffer object we use. And then you also have, since this is an enumeration, we have the enumeration value. So in this case, enable and disable. It's more or less a Boolean option, although it has like proper descriptions for it. Cool. That being said, let's look at things from a Mesa perspective. So how exactly Mesa gets the data out of, of um, user's computer. So first of all, it parses everything that is inside the data here. 
and this is slash dnirc.d here and everything that is inside that it's alphabetically sorted and basically it reads everything then it parses the dnirc file which is in the sysconf here and then finally it goes to whatever the user defined it in his home directory and it really parses all those sources and it's this exact order and it always uh, replaces the options with the subsequent one so if we define something in the data here and later we define it again in the user here the user here always takes preference cool and in case you're wondering those crazy names data here and sysconf here they're defined at compile time by mesa so by default i have developers here and we also offer those options as compile time options in adriconf because we basically need to read from the same place so in case you are custom compiling Mesa, you can also custom compile Adriconf and have basically the same options. Cool. That being said, let's take a look how previously things were looking at uh, DRIConf. So this is basically it, in case you miss it or you never saw it. And it has a bunch of problems. Let's quickly go through them. So first of all, it has a quite confusing UI. And with confusing, I mean, if you look at this screen, it's full, there's a lot of options and, and combo boxes everywhere. And that's because there's actually two very different things happening here. The first one on the top and in blue, it's basically the default profile. So options that are applied to all applications. And on the second part, there is the application specifics or custom profile. So you can go there and in our previous example, for example, the Tux Racer, it would appear here. So that's one source of confusion because things are mixed in the same screen. Uh, the next problem is regarding Prime. So as you are quite aware for, I guess, more than 10 years now, there's like a lot of uh, laptops, for example, that usually tend to ship with an integrated graphics card and then a discrete one. So you have two cards, but then it's, it's quite complicated because if you don't support it, so it's like, doesn't work so and with doesn't work I mean you can still go and write the file by hand but that's I mean that's not very friendly so to say so it's easier if if the DRI can support it but it doesn't which brings us to the next one so as I mentioned before the user configuration is defined in this um, .drirc file in its home directory and Mesa ships by default a file called 00 Mesa defaults. And that file is basically used by Mesa developers when they need to ship a fix either to a game or another application and they can literally put anything there. And literally they do, there's a lot of good defaults there and options. And this is basically to improve performance and make it work better. But the problem with DRI Conf is that whenever you add an application profile or change something, it goes and writes a full file in the home directory, which essentially means whatever it's now shipped by Mesa developers as a fix, it doesn't apply anymore because Mesa always takes precedence the, from the file that is on the home directory. So in case you use DRIConf, basically you nullify any future improvement that Mesa developers do. And that is one of the biggest problem. And I guess it's also a reason why a lot of people started to tell users to not use this application anymore, because it's simply making useless whatever efforts Mesa developers do to fix or improve applications. Yeah, it's it's a face bomb. That's why the meme. <laughs> cool. The next thing. Oh, by the way, it was not properly maintained. So last time I saw some activity was in 2007. So it was like yeah there's nobody looking at that anymore or at least not i couldn't find it in any repository activity or anybody doing anything with that and that's also part of the problem i guess cool which brings us to the next topic and before anything else cool thanks say hi to adriconf this is how it looks basically and Let's go quickly through its features of how we are improving on top of what DRIConf was providing. First of all, the UI. Hopefully, it's a bit more user-friendly. So, 
trying my best to make this as useful and as intuitive as possible. And as always, if you have some issue with it, or if you find something that is not working as you expect, or you think it's confusing, feel free to open an issue and more than happy to discuss or take a look or improve anything. Um, it supports Prime, so in case you have multiple GPUs, we support you. Um, there's also some merge logic before writing the options, and I guess it's interesting for us to dig a bit into it. Basically, we follow the same logic that Mesa do, so we read configurations file from the system-wide directories, we merge everything, we also look at what is the, Mesa, what is the driver default for that option, and we only really write those options down in the DRIRC file when the option that the user changes is different from a default or already defined option. So if, let's say, by default, Tux Racer has an option saying true, and we only write it down if the user goes and say, okay, this option should now be false. This is a bit tricky, because if the user really wants the option to be false, to be true, we don't write it down, we depend on the default, but that's, I think that's also an advantage, because whenever Mesa developers understand something is broken and it's better for it to be false, they can just change and now everybody receives the benefit of it. Cool, what next? Oh, there's a maintainer, that's me, just in case. Uh, cool, let's take a look at how the UI works, so how everything fits together. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have those sections and those are basically uh, designed as tabs on the left so and um, whatever comes is the description so here I'm running Adriconf in English so if you run it in German you see the options in German and so on of course depending on what translations are available on Mesa uh, then we have the option description this is basically well, I guess the name says everything, whatever the option is defined, and again, it's dependent on what Mises defines for each option, what the driver developers set. And then comes the type. And yeah, the type, let's take a look. What about them? So there's a bunch of those. Basically, we support Booleans, which we draw as this nice click button. Uh, there's integers, which basically we design as this small box that you can increase and decrease. And there's also enums, which basically we draw as combo boxes. Technically, Mesa also supports uh, floats and strings. Although I never saw any driver using it, so we don't support them on Adriconf, basically because I never saw them. But if you intend to add one of those, or you see any driver that uses it, feel free to ping me and I'm more than happy to think how to better drive them or how to better design to show them beautifully in the screen. Cool, and how did we get there? That's, that's an interesting part. So initially, there is those two functions that were in, uh, introduced in 2006 by Felix, together when he introduced DRIConf. And this is basically to get the driver and whatever driver config is available. Uh, that's not part of any OpenGL extension. And that's a huge, huge problem. And the reason for that is when you ask Mesa to give you a function pointer, which is the way you get it, by the way, um, Mesa will always return you a function pointer. And that's cool from Mesa part because it's, it's a smart way of implementing it. So there's less overhead and it only does the lookup and really gives you the proper function when it's scaled. so there's a virtual lookup table. The problem with that is if the driver doesn't support those functions or doesn't expose it, you basically never get it. So you get a function pointer that is valid and when you use it, basically the application will set fault. And I saw this happen by myself, so that's how I know it's super broken. So since it's not part of any extension, there is really no way to to test if the function is available and the driver implements it. Oh, by the way, it also doesn't work under Wayland. And by that, I mean, um, technically, you can still call them when you are under Wayland because, I mean, there's the X11 wrapper and everything around there, the X Wayland, but it's 
I mean, everybody's moving away from Wayland, so we shouldn't be relying on GLX functions anymore. We should move everything we can to to a Wayland, more agnostic way. And so, yeah, those functions are also not very nice in that regard. And yeah, this was basically main problems with it. Although we initially used them, this is not exactly enough for us. Which brings us to a new extension. So we were in need to have a proper way to query those things. And this introduces us to EGL Mesa Query Driver. And this extension has this signature. Basically, we get, we take a EGL display and then basically look up whatever is the driver name and the driver configuration available, if any. And they're very similar to the GLX ones, with the exception of the get driver configuration, which before was just taking a driver name. You could literally pass anything. Now we take a proper pointer to a display, which is much cleaner. There's official specification link in case you want to take a look. I'll share this presentation later. Um, but this extension was not done by me. So it was originally introduced by Veluri Mitun with the help of Rob Clark and Nikolai Henley. And Veluri is basically an Evox student from 2018. So he made this endless vacation of code. Contributed a lot to Adriconf, not only this extension to Mesa itself, but also contributed to Flatpak packaging. So now, yeah, we have a proper Flatpak. Also wrote a bunch of unit tests, so made in general a lot of improvements to Adriconf in general. So thanks, Valerie, for, for that. Um, cool, you can get it on FlatHub in case you want. So it's available there. And for the future, so where we want to go with Adriconf, uh, first thing would be Vulkan support. I didn't have proper time to really dig deeper into Vulkan, and I should because it's some years old already. Uh, basically, I guess I will hook some extension up in the phys uh, VK physical device, I likely query from there. But yeah, I need to really to take a look on the API, how it works. And Vulkan introduces a very nice feature, which is you can tell what is the name of the rendering engine you're using. And Mesa devs are quite smart because they already expose this also in the configuration. So when you're under Vulkan, you can actually set a configuration for an engine, which is super cool because now you can apply a configuration that is for a general engine. Let's say Unreal Engine has something that is, I don't know, works better when a specific option is set. So now we can go and set this by engine, which is a very interesting addition. And of course, we want to also support that. And finally, but not less important, is usability improvements. So my understanding is that Adriconf is not perfect, and I want really to improve it and make it more and more user-friendly. So I'm trying, whenever I have time to take a look, try to figure out how to make it better. And yeah, hopefully it will get better with time. So if you have any uh, hints or insights or something you think could be better in that application, feel free to ping me to open an issue on, on GitLab. And yeah, I'm always open to hear. And yeah, that was it. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to shoot them. So hello, we are here live with the author of the presentation and indeed we have a couple of questions from IRC. So the first question is, what UI toolkit has been used? Um, I used mostly GTK MM, so GTK Plus, basically. Uh, okay, thanks. Another question is, do you have the database of all possible configuration options? Uh, no, so basically each driver can define the configuration day one. That's why we need those extensions to basically query the driver. And yeah, that's it. Basically we query them and then the drivers return whatever options they support with the proper descriptions. And, and this is the way also an area if anybody is interested in contributing to translations because I saw one or two languages supported, but many are missing and Mesa has translations for all those options. So if you're missing anything, Mesa is the way to go. Okay, so that means you also get the human readable strings for those two. Yes, yes. You get the exact description on everything that appears on the screen. Most of the text comes directly from querying Mesa. 
Uh, okay, so I guess this is it for the questions. Thank you very much for your presentation and for working on the tool. There are a couple of people on the IRC that had also seems to be really appreciative. And cool. that's it. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Thanks, guys. See you around. Thank you. Yep.
Okay, Lyud, the stage is yours. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lee Paul. I'm the uh, current secretary for the X.org Foundation. Um, and of course, this talk is on the uh, current state of the X.org Foundation. Uh, so, but first, I'd like to give a big thanks to Intel for hosting this conference virtually for us um, and for originally going to be hosting it physically. Uh, thank you for all the help that you've done. And uh, you guys have done a great job with getting the live stream running and keeping things running well. Uh, all right. So first off, our sponsors. Um, hold on. There we go. OK, sponsors. Uh, so we got about 13 sponsors this year, uh, so pretty good. Um, obviously, we didn't have any travel grants due to um, COVID-19. Um, hopefully, we'll see some next year. Uh, and of course, uh, big thanks to Eric for doing all the invoicing for all of that. Um, they've been a huge help. Uh, so next is XDC Talks and Papers Committee. So we got about 30 free talks this year um, compared to about 42 from last year. Uh, Pretty expected, um, seeing as it's a virtual conference this time. Um, but we still did pretty good overall uh, compared to our expectations. Um, we had one workshop, of course, um, and this was our first virtual conference. Um, so, you know, uh, I think it went pretty well. Uh, if you guys have any feedback uh, or anything we could improve on, please don't, uh, please don't hesitate to let us know. Um, and of course, a big thanks to Samuel for uh, helping out and along with the rest of the papers committee um, for helping to approve talks and go through everything. All right, so for XDC 2021, um, we've already started the RFP process. Uh, that means if you are a location that would actually like to host XDC, um, the offer to do so is open. Um, we've got plenty of information on that uh, link that you can use to figure out more if you'd like to host. Um, sponsors, of course, are very welcome. Um, we can use all the money that we can get, uh, and it goes towards um, both helping run XDC along with helping run our infrastructure, um, such as GitLab. Uh, a warning though, um, next XDC may or may not be virtual. Um, obviously, that's all going to depend on how things look with COVID. Um, we're hoping to make it physical if things are looking good enough for people to be able to travel at that point. But uh, anyone who is considering hosting should prepare for both possibilities. All right. So um, Google Summer of Code, uh, really successful. Um, I mean, we only had one student, but they were successful. So I think that's pretty successful. Um, and of course, we can always use uh, extra help uh, wherever we can get it. Um, forgot to add it to this slide, but uh, thanks to Trevor Warner for helping out uh, with Google Summer of Code. A uh, huge help and definitely wouldn't have been possible without them. So. Uh, New things. Um, so we uh, first off, we now offer to pay for professional COC training for project maintainers and other relevant community members. Um, this is something that we mentioned at XTC 2019, and there was a pretty good amount of interest in it. So we decided to um, we decided to make the service available to pretty much everyone. Um, we've only had a couple of requests so far, so. Um, but anyone who is maintaining a project or who is any other in any other relevant community position where they could use that sort of knowledge, um, feel free to contact us and we'll be more than happy to set you up uh, with an appointment. Um, so our VESA, sorry, VESA relationship has been renewed. Um, for those who weren't aware, a uh, while back, a couple of years ago, we used to be um, uh, I don't know if member would be the right word, but we used to be affiliated with FASA in such a way that we could get specification access for various XORG members um, who would not be able to do so otherwise due to not having a corporate sponsor. Um, we've actually brought that back. Uh, I 
uh, me along with the rest of the board, uh, we worked with uh, VESA and now we can, um, for people who aren't part of a corporation and don't have, you know, other resources to get through or get these specifications through, uh, we are able to provide access. Uh, so, you know, not just corporate sponsored people can work in the community, anyone can, if they have a uh, relevant use for, you know, seeing any of these display ports specifications or anything else that VESA offers. Um, we have more information uh, for that on our website. Um, if you need a link, you can ask me. I think it's on the front page, but uh, we were having issues getting it to come up last night. So I will have to double check after this talk. Um, all right, so uh, FDO uh, COC transparency report. Um, luckily, not a whole ton to talk about here. Uh, we only really had uh, one formal complaint that needed to be resolved um, within the 12 months. Uh, and there was one formal warning issued to the offending person um, and have not had any issues with that thus far afterwards. Uh, so that's pretty good. And thank you for Peter for helping come up with the summary and helping out with uh, COC enforcement along with the rest of our COC team. All right, so state of FDO. Um, so just a general update on some of the stuff that happened since last XTC. Um, so as many of you are aware, uh, GitLab was successful. Um, the downside, it was very successful. I mean, it's an upside, but uh, it definitely was a big resource drain initially. Um, and it ended up draining a lot more resources than we anticipated. Um, so we sent out some mail asking for help and got a couple of volunteer admins. Um, Benjamin Tiswar joined a uh, volunteer admin team and worked along with uh, Daniel and uh, GitLab, um, like as in the actual GitLab Foundation, um, in order to help us work to bring hosting costs back down to a reasonable amount, um, more so to where we expected them to be. Uh, and originally, we were potentially looking at having to shut down GitLab, but that's no longer the case. Um, those financial issues are we're uh, perfectly fine for the short term now. Um, and additionally, uh, a big thank you to Packet, who uh, helped by offering us a bunch of hosting services that we've been using and has been uh, lowering a lot of our infrastructure costs overall. Uh, so big thanks to Packet. Um, now, uh, while the short term is resolved, um, there's still definitely work to be done. Um, we want to make sure, you know, obviously that this never really happens um, again. So uh, we want to make sure that we actually have, you know, a good understanding of what kind of resources we're using and also to bring things down to a level where we can be assured that they're going to be fine in the long term. Um, so like I said, it's fine for short term, but long term needs some work. So if anyone wants to help out, um, we can always use more motivated volunteer admins. Um, I would say contact uh, the email there and we'll be more than happy to give you information on how to get involved. All right. So um, and of course, there is uh, the XORG Foundation, um, us. Uh, you can join it. You're part of XDC. You probably are qualified to be a member. Um, and being a member has some of those benefits, like I mentioned before, that you can apply for. Uh, so if you've ever been, if you've ever worked with uh, XORG at all, um, pretty much in any of our projects, uh, you're probably qualified to be a member. Um, and of course, we've got a link to the website that you can go to to sign up right there. Um, it'd be appreciated if, if uh, everyone could sign up. And that is it. Um, thank you all for your time. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, so far, no questions. But I would like to say also on the transition with GitLab that, um, I mean, now Bugzilla is, is completely read-only and uh, the transition went apparently smoothly or well enough. So this is another thing that uh, another part of the legacy infrastructure that is gone to so GitLab is really helpful. Definitely. I'm still waiting for more questions. Uh, don't have anything yet.
Uh, Matt, uh, Matthew Herb is saying thanks for the Xorg Foundation update. Uh, Benjamin Tiswa is tapping. <laughs> thank you for the virtual class and thank you for the virtual thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, matter. Okay. Well, I guess um, that's it. And uh, please tune back in less than 20 minutes for the lightning talks. And then we'll just have the oh, closing uh, session. We do have one quick question. Oh. Um, is there anything we need to have to be able to become a member? Um, as long as you're involved with the community in some way, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a developer position, but if you're actively interacting with the community, you know, maybe you contribute to a project or maybe uh, you contribute in some other manner, um, then that's pretty much enough. Um, when you join, there'll be a little blurb where you can say how you're involved with the community and we'll take a look at that and accept, you know, um, if it's something that's actually involved in the community. So, yeah, there's not really a whole ton to it. Very, very good. So I was about to say that we have the lightning talks next and then the closing session and that will be already the end of the conference. So let's uh, uh, join back in 18 minutes for the lightning talks. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone.
So we are live with the lightning talks. We are going to start with two presentations by Simon. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, I'm Simon Sarah. And uh, James Jones is uh, here as well, I think. Yep, yeah, I... So uh, we had a, a workshop about uh, allocation constraints uh, yesterday. And uh, this is a summary of the discussions we had uh, back then. Um, so um, we, dis we, we, were, we wanted to make sure that our high level design was uh, fine. So uh, we are pleased to see that there was no obje objections to the high level de design. And the idea to have uh, a common function to merge con constraints uh, was fine too. Um, the fact that we use one uh, constraint set per modifier uh, seemed uh, like it would work fine with uh, uh, current hardware. Um, we, we were wondering if um, vendor the constraints uh, would be necessary. Uh, so a little bit like modifiers where you have a file of, with uh, a, a registry of uh, vendor the constraints. Uh, so it seems like we don't uh, need them now. Uh, but uh, anyways, if we end up uh, needing them, it's possible to extend the current design to support them. So that should be no, no issue. Um, we also talked about the fact that uh, um, constraint sets uh, have a serialized form. So that makes it so we can set, send them over the wire, uh, over Wayland or X11. So that's good. Uh, we talked for a bit about the EGL API. Um, because we need uh, some kind of flag to, to say to EGL whether we'll use uh, a buffer for texturing or for rendering. And it seemed like external only would be a good enough of a proxy for that. Um, we talked for a bit about allocators. For now, we target uh, only GBM or Vul and, and Vulkan in our proposal. Uh, but it's not a good fit good fit for uh, things like uh, camera and uh, encoding, video encoding. Um, so um, there's no uh, solution to this yet, but uh, we noted that our design should work fine with new allocators anyway, because you can just uh, extend the allocator API to take a constraint set. So it should work fine once we have something else, for instance. Um, we we asked about possible tricky uh, hardware limitations that would need to be encoded into constraints. Uh, there were some examples like uh, buffer objects planes with uh, each plane in a different bank and uh, shadow buffer blitz necessary between layout transitions and Vivante. Um, yeah, we, we'll keep those in mind. I think it should work. Um, we talked also about uh, storing extra met metadata in, in, in some pixels. Um, so this is not fully solved by constraints. I think it was a question from ARM. It's not fully solved by constraints, but constraints help. Uh, but yeah, there, there are some things which are outside of the scope of constraints, which need yeah something else. Um, we ask also uh, what would what should be the home for the merging library. Uh, so our current solution is to use a, a new API header. Uh, some issues with that is that everything is public, so we can't have uh, internal helpers or uh, internal structures. And um, also, all of the logic is inline uh, downstream in compositors and uh, all users. So if we want to add a new constraint, we need to recompile uh, all of this downstream usage. So that's not great. Um, another solution is to use uh, VDSO, um, but we need to justify inclusion in the kernel. Uh, so we need to, yeah, we, we can't just put anything in the VDSO. <laughs> Uh, it's not yet clear if uh, we would have a case, uh, a good enough case to, to, to make it. Um, 
the kernel definitely need, needs to uh, produce constraints for KMS, for instance. Uh, but uh, maybe the merging constraints could be useful too. Yeah, we, we're not sure, not sure yet. Uh, another solution is to use uh, share, uh, to put the merging uh, library in a shared user space library uh, synced from the kernel. Um, it's pretty small, so it could um, maybe be part of uh, libdrm, and it seems like this idea was uh, pretty well received. So maybe we'll go with that uh, going forward. Um, James, do you want to continue? Uh, sure. Um, so there, there was a question about how we'd handle things like a constraint that dictates whether memory should be accessed, cached, or uncached from the CPU. Um, and how we would expose that? Would that be a property of a particular heap of memory, or would it be something expressed separately? Um, the, the answer isn't totally clear right now, but one thing we talked about is that if it was a separate constraint, it might make sense to expose that from you know the mapping APIs themselves rather than trying to return it from, say, KMS. Um, so like if you asked GBM for a buffer that you could map, um, you could return, return new constraints that say you know it should be cached or uncached or something. Um, it, was, it was clear that the, the heap ID proposal is, you know, a work in progress. Heap IDs themselves are a rather large problem space. Um, so there's discussion about how, how we should solve that. You know, um, should we should we make everything go through the DMA above heap API to get a heap ID? Should there be the namespaces like we proposed? Um, uh, so we need to build up the use cases there. You know, find the find the the, the killer use case and. Maybe start out with just a local unshareable, you know, meaning like your video memory, or, and a non-local shareable, meaning the rest of system memory and everything that everyone can talk to. Um, and find a way to expose these and discover them through some programmatic means, uh, both within the kernel probably and um, for, for user space apps that want to allocate from them. Um, so there's some open items still. Uh, so there's more concrete proposals to come on some of these things. Um, the next action was going to be that I'm going to start an email chain with the, the people at the workshop and others we nominated to that were probably interested, um, mostly people from the DMA buff heap community. Um, if anyone has ideas and suggestions or wants to track things, um, we, we decided to use uh, the GitLab page for the, the current DRM constraints and prototype library as a place to file issues and, and track the development for now. Um, and that might evolve over time, but that's the, that's the current link. One more slide here with the shameless plug. Um, I still haven't checked in the code from my uh, presentation last year about adding format modifiers to or more detailed format modifiers to Nouveau. So if you have time, please review these merge requests. Um, one just reworks the the way we handle auxiliary planes in Gallium to make it so that the the auxiliary plane data is actually local to the drivers that use it, uh, and the other one adds the more detailed format modifier stuff that I presented last year to. Uh, the Mesa Nouveau Gallium driver. Um, and this is blocking some of the more interesting stuff that I presented on last year, like format modifier transitions and uh, enabling compression for more formats in Nouveau. So take a look at those. Um, and then we can move on to the constraint stuff. Yes. Thank you for, the, for participating in the workshop. That was pretty uh, constructive, I think. So second presentation from Simon today. Yeah. Uh, hi again. <laughs> I'm Simon Sir. <laughs> and I'll talk about W loads. Um, the the future steps for W loads. So just uh, for people who don't know yet, W loads is a Wayland compositor library. So you can use it to build a compositor. Um, it's, it contains a set of pluggable, composable, and uh, an opinionated modules. Uh, so basically, you can start with using uh, all of the value routes, and then you can uh, start thinking that you need some more custom stuff for, for instance, rendering. And you can throw away the value routes renderer to do something else. You can um, you can do the customize basically. Uh, uh, everything. So uh, it's been used, uh, for instance, by uh, 
game scope to do pretty crazy stuff and completely removes uh, our backends. Uh, this is completely fine and this is not a hack at all. Uh, it works pretty well. So it's about uh, 50,000 lines of code you are going to write anyway uh, at the beginning, and then you can customize stuff. So um, what does uh, WROOT architecture looks like? So you have some compositor code here in blue that is not part of WROOTs, and then uh, some of our WROOTs modules can be used by the compositor. So for instance, backends, uh, the compositor can use uh, ready-made uh, libinput and DRM backends uh, to get input events and show display things on screen. And you also have other backends, such as Wayland, X11, Headless. And uh, the compositor also needs to talk to um, Wayland clients. Uh, so WLOADS contains some uh, protocol interface uh, implementations uh, so, for instance, WL Compositor. Uh, there are also some of our uh, implementations, such as WL uh, SHM, which allows uh, uh, clients to push uh, buffers to compositors, to share buffers with compositors. Linux DMA buff for uh, GPU buffers. And we also have some uh, protocol extensions to allow clients to capture uh, the Contents as a screen. That's what I am using right now. <laughs> um, so with all of this, the compositor can get buffers from client and can display stuff, but it also needs to render stuff. So we have some uh, rendering code to help with that. Um, so how does that integrate with the existing graphics API? Um, so we're using EGL and OpenGL right now. <coughs> So um, I, I'd, I'd say the first step is uh, that backends uh, create an EGL, an EGL display and a, an EGL surface. Uh, this is backend specific. You don't, you don't create it the same way on, on DRM and on Wayland. So the backends need to do this. And then the backend gives it to the renderer it's because the renderer needs the EGL context. <laughs> the compositor can then uh, call functions such as EGL make current, EGL swap buffers, and everything like this uh, to control when to uh, uh, swap, to push frames to the backends and display them. Um, protocol implementations such as uh, SHM need to upload textures to the GPU. Linux DM above need to import textures uh, to the GPU. Uh, and then the compositor can talk to the render and, and ask uh, the render to perform some GL calls um, to draw things on screen. The screen, screen copy uh, implementation can um, download or export uh, some uh, render buffers and uh, give, give them out to the clients. Uh, there's some more hairy stuff going on with the DRM backend. Uh, because we need some special rendering code for the cursor, um, which only accepts certain sizes in some cases and some certain uh, formats. Uh, we also need some uh, rendering code to, uh, to, to perform multi-GPU, to bleed images, basically, between, uh, between GPUs. Uh, so, yeah, some more EGL bits there. And we have some pretty complicated stuff going on for, for cursors because the clients can can set the cursor and we need to share this cursor with the DRM backend so the texture gets transferred somehow. Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty messy. And that was only the easy part because we want to implement a lot of other features. Uh, so uh, one of these features, uh, zero copy presentation, uh, known as direct scan out. Uh, we want to do that with multiple planes. Um, we want to implement explicit synchronization. We want to implement multiple renderers, for instance, Vulkan uh, and Pixman. We want to implement zero copy screen capture. We want to implement being able to use headless and DRM backends at the same time. So all of this makes the current um, architecture pretty complicated. Uh, and some of these features are not really, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> pretty hard to support them. Uh, some of the features are already implemented, by the way, uh, but not all of them. 
Um, so we could uh, choose to abstract away all the EGL things to be able to use Vulkan and uh, things like this and try to glue everything together in a single, under a single interface. But that would be a lot of work and pretty complicated. So um, Scott Anderson, that uh, idea to completely throw away all the EGL things, that means stop using EGL surface uh, and uh, only care about abstracting a single thing, which is buffers. So we've introduced uh, a WLR buffer uh, abstraction, and uh, we can basically use it everywhere. That's pretty cool. Uh, we've added a new allocator, uh, which can allocate from GBM and gives out buffers to the compositor. Uh, the protocol implementations can give uh, buffers coming from client to the compositor. The render can import all of these and uh, texture from render to uh, the buffers. All the backends can, can accept uh, buffers and the screen copy can uh, grab buffers. Uh, so uh, we only talk with, with buffers. Um, that's the plan. Uh, it's still a work in progress, but uh, we'll get there eventually. Um, that allows us to simplify a lot uh, internal architecture. That's it. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you, Simon. And we are now going to switch to Roman, who is sharing. So, Roman, are you ready? Hello, yes. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, and right. uh, your slides are on, so you can start. Great. Um, yeah, I will quickly uh, introduce a small project I was working on in the last month mainly and before it as well. It's called Disman and it's uh, the tagline is universal display management. You can see here a UI application making use of Disman. Disman um, is primarily aimed at uh, managing multi-display setups. The motivation for that is that these multi-display setups are pretty common and the configuration of uh, multi-display uh, setup or even a single display can be complex. And uh, normally a user wants the, uh, the configuration to be remembered for the next time the session restarts and so on. There are also different windowing systems and compositors in uh, Wayland, in the Wayland windowing system, which have uh, different interfaces. For example, on X11, uh, Rondor is used. And on Wayland, we have a multitude of different interfaces for display management. Uh, the first one, WL, OK, I won't read all of them, but the first one is by WL Roots. The second one is by QuinFT. Then KDE has also a separate output management protocol. And other compositors, like, for example, Mutter, use Dbus. So uh, coming to Disman, what exactly is this thing? It's uh, first and foremost a library for front end creation. So that's uh, probably the most interesting uh, part for the community. So you can use it uh, to write a UI for display management. It's uh, for the uh, for the client. It's only required to use C++ 11. And at the moment, there is still some Qt in the uh, AP surface, but my goal is to remove this over time. Use CMake, and uh, I also want to commit to SEM there, but at the moment, there is not yet a stable release. Uh, this man uh, on the front end, it has this library. On the back end, uh, there are several plugins that can be loaded at runtime, depending on which windowing system is used and uh, what compositor is detected. Uh, so these backend plugins can be loaded either in process by the client, making use of the library Disman, or they can be uh, loaded out of process via a Dbus service. The Dbus service uh, has automatic activation, so it's called once in the session and then it's running continuously until the session stops. So this can be done, for example, with Disman uh, CTL, Disman Control, which is a command line tool. And you can just issue, for example, Disman CTL uh, dash W, and then uh, it watches continuously all changes and the Dbus service is started, which then loads configurations and talks to the windowing system. Coming to a quick overview in a... Um, in this table. So we have at the top, we have clients which want to make uh, use of Disman for 
display management and they would either call uh, talk directly to the backend we are uh, an environment variable this is the leftmost direct client or they can use the dbus service and then uh, talk via dbus to this service which then has already loaded some windowing system plugin and it has also some file control which saves the uh, the configuration of the outputs and the overall setup to some files on disk in the user directory so that's uh, directly one of the features. So it saves and loads the display data. Uh, it can do this per combination of displays. So it identifies a display. It normally does this via the, uh, via the display uh, manufacturer and the model and the serial number and also via the connector it is uh, connected to. That's because uh, displays can have different properties depending on which connector they are connected to. For example, on display port, maybe they have a higher resolution or refresh rate than on HDMI. So the, you can do this per combination of display or you can do this globally for, uh, for a display. So when you change the scale of your display, for example, once to two, then it will be remembered in all fu future uh, setup so you don't have to uh, reapply it all the time but you can still override it for specific combinations for example if you have uh, a laptop with a high dpi and at work you use it in a uh, with a keyboard it's further away then you can for this specific combination with an external display then most often you can use uh, you can set a specific scale factor which is only applied when it generates opti optimal configuration. If you connect a new output, it has an automatic selection of resolution and refresh rate, or you can manually override it. You can also uh, do display replication, or it's often called mirroring. And it has laptop, laptop lit detection via UPower and lock and D. So if you uh, close the lid and an external monitor is connected, it will disable the uh, laptop uh, display. So that was this man, K display. Uh, that's uh, a fork of K screen, uh, the KDE utility for that. And it uh, um, previously it had all the logic in it. So that's what I did last month. I basically uh, removed all the logic from K display and implemented it in uh, this man, uh, most of it. So uh, you can, it's basically gutted now in just a UI application, but it's a good example of how you can make use of this man. It has an independent graphical app for changing the display settings, and it also has a plasmoid for the KDE workspace, so you can quickly change it from your taskbar. And of course, it makes use of a this man library. Yeah, you can see it here. It has automatic resolution, refresh rate, and so on currently enabled, and uh, you can yeah, change various parameters of your displays. So future plans is uh, maybe support for docking of laptops. I would like to add a GNOME Matter Wayland backend plugin, which then uh, talks to the DBus interface of GNOME Matter. Uh, I want to stabilize the implementation and clean up the library AP. I want in this, in this I want to remove the Qt dependencies from this one as much as possible. At least uh, it shouldn't be part of the library API. And at some point, I want to release a stable release 1.0. Next week, I plan to release a beta uh, for uh, the next unstable release, at least. So project organization, uh, you can see here the URLs of the project homes. You can send in merge requests. Uh, they, are see, they are built automatically and auto-tested on CI, and uh, the releases are aligned with KDE Plasma. As I said, next week, beta release went with the next KDE Plasma release, uh, the next uh, unstable uh, release. And uh, yeah, the development is open via GitLab issues, uh, check by, check it out. Uh, you're welcome to try it out. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Roman. And now we are going to switch for the last presentation of the day before the closing session, which is by Bas. OK, Bas, you're on. Hi, all. I'm going to talk about um, an update for AMD DRM modifiers and why modifiers. So basically the thing why I, I want to have modifiers on AMD hardware is that it's very important for image imports of Vulkan like uh, the Vulkan it, it, normal Vulkan extensions only really do Vulkan to Vulkan so if you want to import something that wasn't created by Vulkan you have a problem unless you use modifiers and that's essential for things like compositors using Vulkan like Gamescope can currently do it but it has pretty much driver specific hacks to make this somewhat work 
It's also relevant for zero copy video playing, like when you want to import a, a buffer from the decoder. Uh, it helps with compression for non full screen windows, like when, for example, the display unit can't use compression, but rendering can and texturing can, then you can use for non full screen windows. And the other feedback I got was that for overlay and underlay planes in compositors, compositors are often uncertain whether they can use a, an extra plane because with modifiers, it's not always possible to scan out on an extra plane. So that's kind of use cases where you can use modifiers to enable that. And the basic thing a modifier is, is just an, a 64-bit int that says like, hey, this is the kind of texture layout I'm going to use for this image. And we kind of want that to be an injection. And typically on AMD hardware, we use like three texture layouts. So trivial implementation. We define linear, we define displayable, and we define non-displayable. And we're done, right? Well, not quite that far because there's GPU and driver differences. Like AMD tends to change their texture layouts like every uh, new chip, one way or another, and often between chips in the same generation as well. And then there's some data that is driver only and it's in the texture memory. So if we update the driver, we would have to change that. Um, so for the GPU differences, like there's some options here, like you can add a chip ID as a parameter to the modifier, but then like chips with the same texture layout will result in duplicate modifiers. Like if chip A and chip B have the same texture layouts and we use two parameters, then all the drivers uh, in the kernel and user space would need to have the same logic to figure out like, hey, these are really the same modifiers. We need to expose either neither or both of them or something like that. So that gets quite complicated quickly. Um, another option would be to add parameters to completely identify texture layout. And that's what I've mostly gone with, but it gets quite detailed and complicated because there's really a lot of options uh, depending on the hardware, how this changes. Um, so yeah, I, I tried to send an RFC like one plus years ago and that's got a bunch of pushback. Like the total modifier info was about 40 bits out of the 64. And some people also questioned my source data on which parameters are actually relevant for the texture layout. And uh, uh, that took me uh, uh, back quite a bit, uh, especially because as third party hobbyist developer, it's kind of hard to exhaustively go and test all hardware to make sure that the texturing library you used really corresponds to literally every hardware out there. Uh, so I kind of let it sit for a while and now I'm back with a new approach. I'm doing only uh, newer GPUs for now, um, partly because there's a cl clean break in texture layouts, like it's much simpler now. Uh, which means I can iterate quickly. Uh, it has more interesting things we can do with compression. So it's actually more useful than for the old hardware. And I have an almost complete hardware collection to test. So I can actually resolve the pushback. And I have so, uh, so the status is pretty much that I have it working with GL and the kernel. And I have some older revision working with Vulkan, which I still need to publish. Uh, the GL, uh, Support is in pretty good state. Uh, kernel, it it works and is tested, but could definitely use more feedback. And then on the to-do list, I would like to publish the Vulkan support. I would like to add IDT test because there's almost no automated testing for display side of things at this point. And I would like to add the names to DRM info as a quality of life thing. And I have a personal repo with some issues. And if you have ideas or uh, concerns, feel free to add it to, to this central location. Thank you all. OK, thank you, Bas. That's, so that was the last presentation of the day. And now on to the closing session. Hello again, last time, I guess, for this year's XDC 2020. Uh, 
before I, I start, I'd like to thank all the speakers and also folks who raised the bar and brought some lightning talks at the end. You guys rock. And, you know, thank you f to all the speakers because without you, there would be no conference, right? We wouldn't have uh, to organize it if there were no people really wanting to share their experience and knowledge. So thanks for that. Uh, big thanks goes for to the organizers, to, to Intel, all together with XORG Foundation. Thanks also to XORG for uh, you know, having us and allowing us to organize this event this year. Uh, thanks to our Platinum sponsor, Intel. Thanks to Gold sponsor, Google. Thank you, Google. Thanks for another Gold sponsor, NVIDIA. Thank you to our Silver Level sponsors, Collabora, Igalia, the Linux Foundation. Thank you to Microsoft, AMD, and the ARM. Thank you for, for sponsoring XDC 2020. Thanks a lot to all our uh, bronze level sponsors. Thank you to Kronos Group, to Dorota Czaplejewicz and GitLab. Thanks to our supporters, Code Weavers this year. And thank you, LWN.net, for donating a hosting for us. So, speakers. I did thank you at the beginning, but now there is a big ask for you. For the ones that didn't yet put your slides to the website, please don't forget doing so. It will be very useful for uh, everyone that attended the conference. Uh, we would like to hear some feedback on how we did. It was a very new uh, experience for us, first virtual conference, really. Uh, we didn't we didn't plan it this way initially, but uh, year 2020 turned out to be special year for everyone. So please send your feedback directly to the board of XORG Foundation. All this feedback will be reviewed and uh, taken for future improvements. Right? We tried to improve along the way as we were hosting the conference. I hope those uh, improvements were visible and in order to deliver even better experience in the next years. And we don't know whether next year XDC will be virtual or physical. Uh, we really will appreciate you providing the feedback for us. So XDC 2020, year 2020. We started uh, organizing this conference long, long time ago. And uh, as said, uh, it turned virtual just in the middle of this year. So here are some of the pictures on, on the main organizing team. Big thanks for Martin, who helped a lot in making XDC 2020 happen. Martin, you are great. You rock. Same goes to Arek for helping out with our streaming services. You know, it was flawless experience this year. In my opinion, I hope uh, others will share it as well. And uh, in the middle, I also <laughs> did put picture of, well, myself also working on this conference in slightly different form this year. But uh, I think you guys did it, you rock. And, and I think uh, we provided quite pleasant first time uh, virtual conference to our audience. Uh, I'd like to thank, say big thank you to everyone else that was involved, helped us uh, on the way. So Samuel, you were huge support from the very beginning, just from the moment where we were filing to, you know, to become a host for this conference. So thanks a lot for all your help during this time. Really, really appreciate it. Also, uh, we would like to thank Guy Lunardi from Collabora for uh, providing guidance, helping out with some uh, setup for virtual conference. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it, you helped us a lot. And we also really, really appreciated that. I, I did put some uh, names from folks from my teams and from our uh, Intel site in Gdańsk, Poland. As I mentioned, we aimed to organize this event physically. So the entire machine was launched by, with help from Bozena and Marek from Gdańsk. We operated with university from Gdańsk. We were almost ready to set everything up physically when uh, year 2020 changed our plans. 
And I would also like to say a big thank to my team at OSGC, which stands for Open Source Graphics Center at Intel. Without their help, we wouldn't be here as well. So big thank you to, to all of you. And you know, last but not least is like big thank you for everyone that attended this event. We made it for you for the community. We hope that uh, everyone learned a lot and that you met new people, maybe not face to face, but hopefully in the future, th there will be more chances for us to actually meet in person and uh, cooperate on uh, future events and on, on future projects, community driven ones. So once again, thanks a lot and see you next year. Thank you.